I'm Petey Beats from the Devil's Sign Law. Aha, I went with no toe, you fanny. The network does not want to see Negroes on television unless they are fools. Have you ever thought about just quitting? I have a contract. The only way I get out of that is if I get fired. And that is what I intend to do. I love you. You're the one that's telling me every night of my sleep. Yeah? I'm Peter Beatstrom. The devil's son in law. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise at the end of each episode along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. We're talking the Italian stallion, (laughs) Sylvester Stallone, join the sleaze. We decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an on-air shout-out and two bonus episodes every single month, which we have been doing for over three years. There's something like 70 yeah. or 80 bonus episodes, as well as our bonus transmission series where we talk about new release genre movies, which we did just did one on The Empty Man recently that went over really well with a lot of our patrons. So if you haven't made the jump yet, I definitely recommend uh, doing that over at patreon.com slash podcast. And uh, speaking of which, we did have a bunch of people make the jump this uh, week, so awesome. I'm going to give them their shout-outs here. So thanks to uh, Scott Morris, uh, thanks to Spencer, who uh, upgraded their patronage from $5 to $10 to get in on the monthly uh, sort of live screenings that Jamie and I do where we do live reacts to movies. Um, Very awesome. And uh, we just did one for The Hitcher, which was a blast for oh, everyone so who showed good. up for that one. So stay yeah, tuned for whichever movie. one is coming out this month. I think also we're going to do a free one this month. Uh, so pay attention to the Patreon and the social media uh, page where you'll see us maybe even announce another um, free uh, monthly watch that we did with everyone. I think the last time we did one was in for Spooktober where we did Blood Rage, and we had a <laughs> lot of people in there, and that was a fun movie to do. So stay tuned yep. for that. Um, and thanks to um, Connor Willingham, who also upgraded from 5 to 10 this month. Um, and uh, keeping going here, we got David Peggy. We got uh, Clint Wells, Mo Green, Jeremy Frankus, uh, Mitchell Camp, D Beat Cowboy, and Andrew Barber. So thanks so awesome. much to all of you folks. Hope you guys are enjoying all those bonus episodes. Yes, thank um, you. That's the one plug for the week. The other plug, as always, is Apple Podcasts. If you guys are listening on Apple Podcasts and you haven't yet, scroll down to the very bottom while you're listening to this right now. And give us a good old rating and review down at the bottom there. It helps us climb the rank at iTunes and find new listeners. And we, we have been finding new listeners, and I'm seeing it in the reviews that way. So definitely keep doing that. Um, and what's the last plug? The, uh, the newer plug, merch. If merch. you guys like the uh, artwork that uh, local Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for the podcast, the poster art with the bloody knife with yeah. me and Jamie on it, uh, you can get that now put on anything. Uh, check out the link in the description. You can put it on a mug, on a hoodie, on a shirt, on a pillow, whatever you'd like, a notebook. <laughs> That's right. It's all there. So check out the link in the description if you're interested in that or go to sleezoidspodcast.com. All right. That's it for the intro. That's it for the plugs, I guess. We're still in the intro. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Welcome back. We got through that. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, your host, Josh Lewis, and joining me as always is my co-host... Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. I think two weeks ago would have been the last time you guys would have heard from us, and we would have had special guest Eddie Averill of the Extended mm-hmm. Clip podcast on the show, where he brought with him sort of the, uh, the some of the sleazier, more radical side of new Hollywood, and we talked about Targets from 1968 oh, yeah. by Peter Bogdanovich, the directorial debut of Peter Bogdanovich. Um, <laughs> Unreal debut. Which is a really, really insane debut and has one hell of a uh, 
uh, lead perform. I mean, I guess it's kind of like a co-lead performance between the yeah. the, the shooter um, and Boris Karloff. But yeah, very uh, interesting film. If you guys haven't seen a huge inspiration on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well, for anyone who hasn't gotten around to checking that out, I would recommend. And we paired it with Brian De Palma's 1970 film Hi Mom, which is uh, just as crazy in a very different <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, another wild one. Uh, and is uh, sort of a, a comedy precursor to something like Taxi Driver, uh, I- I- including also starring Robert De Niro before he did Taxi Driver, playing a very similar sort of uh, uh, Vietnam vet returning back to the city and kind of going going a, a bit crazy in the underground social movements. Yeah, he even um, has a scene where he uh, looks into a mirror and starts, you know, being like, you want to fight, you want to go, that kind of thing, so... <laughs> He curses that too. <laughs> yes. Um, so if you haven't heard that episode, that was the free episode and available in any podcast listener of choice from two weeks ago. I'd recommend listening to that. Um, and then uh, last week, uh, for over exclusively for, for the patrons, we jumped off of one sequence in Hi Mom, very infamous, called the The Black Baby sequence which uh, yeah. involves Robert De Niro getting involved in sort of like this, uh, this, this recreation for white bougie liberals in the theater, New York theater <laughs> scene to try and give them the idea of what the black experience is like. And they put them in blackface and they beat them and they attack them and they rob them. And it's all kinds of crazy stuff. And it, there's a sequence that kind of mirrors it in a movie called black Caesar starring Fred Williamson. Um, mm where uh, he paints a cop in blackface and beats the shit out of him as some sort of revenge against a very traumatizing um, hate crime that's done to him as a child earlier in the film. So we talked Black Caesar as well as the Isaac Hayes, more sort of fun, sunstroked action black exploitation film, Truck Turner, which just has yeah. him riding around, shooting uh, up various pimps and military <laughs> yeah. people and a force anything that, can't that be he can- stopped. Yeah, that the the movie was originally pitched as Black Bullet, uh, and it it basically is I, Isaac Hayes's version of something like Point Blank or Dirty Harry, and it's an absolute blast. So that was yeah, what we talked fantastic. about on last week's episode, kind of preparing us for uh, this week's episode because uh, we 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 kind of needed it. We kind of needed to give some of our listeners an idea of what the the sort of baseline black exploitation genre kind of looked like before mm-hmm. we were going to get into the more satirical and wilder side of it, uh, which we're going to be doing this week. Uh, and to, to do that, we have a very special guest joining us. He, he's been wanting to come on for a while, uh, and he had a movie picked out that he really, really wanted to do, and I was like, man, that is such a crazy pick, but I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so joining us uh, this week, we have... Uh, he, is a, he is a hip-hop uh, writer for uh, Rolling Stone and Pitchfork and Passion of the Weiss, and he's also, as a listener of the show, he's a huge uh, movie head and crime movie head. So uh, joining us this week is Jason Buford. Jason, how you doing? Yo, I'm good. Feeling good. Um, ready to talk some uh, Petey Weestraw and ready to talk some uh, Bamboozle. So let's yeah. Hell yeah. So I mean, you you already said it there. Those are your those are your two films there. But what what do you yes. think? What do you think is the 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 co- the connection we kind of drew between these two? Because I know you know a lot of the time we we kind of uh, we have the guests just program their own too. But you and I we actually kind of talked through this one a little bit because we were we were trying to figure out you want really wanted to talk about Spike Lee. You really wanted to talk about Bamboozled, and I was like, man, I don't that there's no th- there are hardly any movies out in the world that are like <laughs> Bamboozled. Yeah. So we, we, mean- we, we kind of had trouble coming up with this double feature. <laughs> yeah, we, we 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 went back and forth for a for a week there. It, it was so from <laughs> it, it's really it's so like it's really interesting for me. Spike Lee for me is you know probably the premier director that I grew up with. That I I would like to say was looking at movies in a way that mirrored how I grew up living. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. That goes for do the right thing. That goes for he got game. I mean, I'm 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 from the Bronx, so I mean, playing basketball out on the court, uh, he got game was like that. That means a lot to me. That movie is just emotionally resonant for me, right? And so, Clockers or like any type of I, any type of Spike Lee movie for me, I think was Malcolm X was 
rooted, I think, in my experience growing up. And he was like one of the few directors who made movies like that. Like genuinely like made movies that I could be like, oh, I had moments like that as a kid. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I mean? And so he's one of the few directors that my relationship with is immensely personal. Whereas other directors, my relationship with is just like, oh, I love movies. And I'm just watching this movie. But like, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? But like Spike yeah. Lee is like, oh, wait, I, I've, I've actually been here. Like, I've actually been to these spots. Like, I know where Do the Right Thing was filmed at. Yeah, and right. so, so for me, I think Bamboozle is one of the first movies that Spike made where I was thinking about it in a much less personal way and a much more thinking man's way. And so I really wanted to talk about Bamboozled um, and, and, and and I think Bamboozled has a lot of ideas about self representation and the mm-hmm. good thing the the good that comes with that and the not so good that comes with that mm-hmm. and it has a lot of talk about accessibility and the or I think that white money gives you but mm-hmm. is not necessarily something that it's not necessarily it's not necessarily something that you will come to find that you actually need. And mm-hmm. also, I think Bamboozle has a very interesting relationship with black culture in general and hip-hop in general. And we'll get to that a little bit later. And if you, on the flip side, Petey Weestraw, uh, which is a, a black exploitation film starring Rudy Ray Moore, who also starred as Dolomite, is like, Rudy Ray Moore is nicknamed the godfather of rap, and that's like absolutely true. If you, if DJ Cool Herc is the father of hip-hop, right, if that if hip-hop was, was born from DJ Cool Herc, like... Rudy Ray Moore is the is in that tree as well. Just like the way he would rhyme and the raunchy humor, yeah. and yeah, it's like that is the precursor to Snoop Dogg, right? That's the precursor to mm-hmm. albums like Doggy Style, albums sure. like Street Gospel by Sugar Free. You know what I mean? Those type of the Chronic, like that type of like you know we're <laughs> we're making jokes about women and we're having skits on the album and we're talking about I'm pipping this and I'm pipping that. Like that's like the, and that type of self uh, representation, I think, um, hasn't always been there for black people in Hollywood. And I think mm-hmm. like Rudy Ray Moore is like one of the first able to do that. And hip hop is literally a genre rooted in self representation, right? Like that is mm-hmm. literally the genre of hip hop. It is. Um, I think Chris Rock had a quote one time when he was introducing Kanye. He said that hip hop is a genre for free black men, and no one has done more with that genre than Kanye, right? Mm-hmm. Hip hop is a genre made for free black people, right? And so I think no one, if I may add on to what Chris Rock said, I don't think anyone really. I think the precursor to hip hop and its self expression and its self representation is Rudy Ray Moore. So that's why I wanted to combine both of those movies. And a very interesting Spike Lee, I think, is the self is the self representation of black. People in Hollywood, and I think Rudy Ray Moore is the self representation of black culture in general, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I think it's cool too that like Spike Lee, part of his subject matter is kind of you know the 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 sort of deal with the devil that a lot of black people had to make to get into these kinds of careers, and he, in some ways he's commenting on the black exploitation genre in general. You know, like a lot a lot of these guys. I mean, right. we were talking about it when we did a little bit of Fred Williamson and Isaac Hayes um, last week. But like, you know, there there was a lot of cases in these where these films, you know, were very cynically uh, greenlit by sort of white producers and white directors and white writers who were like, you know, we can we, we found something that's cool that we can sell to the black community. And some of them were very cynically made in that way. But then bouncing off of that, the black exploitation genre was also the first time that a lot of these uh, actors and a lot of these eventually writers and directors got to, you know, make stories where they were the lead character in the movie, where they were the cool <laughs> guy. Rudy Ray Moore makes himself the coolest, uh, best <laughs> oh, yeah. at sex man who's ever lived in his <laughs> movies because he could. Um, so th- we're, it's going to yeah. be fun jumping into, the, I think, the, some of the, the charm of that. Um, but yeah, that being said, I think we are going to jump into it here chronologically. First, we are going to start off with Rudy Ray Moore. So we are going to do... Petey Wheatstraw. Don't brother me, no business. Far back to you, son of a bitch. Petey Wheatstraw. 
Rated R. All right, we are talking uh, Petey Wheatstraw, also known as Petey Wheatstraw, the devil's son-in-law, <laughs> which uh, sums up what this movie is about right off the start. It is a uh, 1977 American black exploitation comedy horror film written and directed by Cliff uh, Rockmore. Um, Cliff was sort of a regular collaborator with, with Rudy Ray Moore and kind of, um, I think Rudy, after, you know, taking so much kind of control on the making of Dolomite, he was kind of more comfortable letting Cliff kind of, uh, ground some of what he wanted to do, um, in, in, by taking over the writing and the directing and everything like that for him. You know, obviously this movie has Rudy Ray Moore. Every Rudy Ray Moore has nothing but him all over the screen. He is the, uh, you know, the, the, the auteur of these films, so to say. But, uh, it was very interesting that, you know, Dolomite, for example, for any, cause we, we haven't talked about it on, on the show, but for anyone who hasn't seen Dolomite, like that movie is amazing, but it's an absolute mess. Like it, it, in terms of its filmmaking, it makes some of the black exploitation films that we've already talked about, you know, look like expensive studio productions, even though they weren't. Um, right. You know, there, there's a, there's a genuinely kind of infectious glee, I think, to how sort of str- barely strung together um, Dolomite is. And for me, you know, seeing the seams on a movie like that doesn't necessarily bother me because. Ultimately, Rudy May- Ray Moore's personality just kind of <laughs> makes a- everything the that feels baffling or I think, surreal. I think the movie would be the movie would look gigantically different if it was like made in a like studio sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't yeah, have well, those, and, like, and, and that's what sort of in, on a sidewalk and that kind of shit. Like it's just it's that's yeah. way more fun. <laughs> you kind of had that at Petey too. Like he's yeah. like. <laughs> He's just like, I'm gonna send y'all back to God. <laughs> and like, and like they're like fighting on the street. He's like chasing these like uh, these like thieves who, who like take the wheels of the car. It's like you know what I mean. Like that would that yeah. would that wouldn't happen if Paramount Pictures had done the movie. Like, <laughs> absolutely. Ab- ab- absolutely. Well, and, and what's funny though is that <laughs> with Cliff Rockmore, who took over directing, I think he ended up directing all of the Dolomite sequels as well, including you know Human Tornado, uh, which has some fucking. I mean, it has just as much uh, terrible kung fu and insane writing as Dolomite oh, yeah. does, but it also has some some crazy shit about how he has, like, a, a girl gang of martial artists, including, like, a trans woman who just kicks absolute ass in that movie, and nice. they take on, like, the entire California mob, and actually that's the scene where they, they uh, very infamously, he has an orgasm that's so powerful it literally makes the walls crumble, <laughs> which is in, they, they, they ended up doing oh, in Dolomite <laughs> is my name, and they, they just made it look like he was shooting it for Dolomite, but really he was shooting yeah. it for the human tornado. It was for the, for, yeah, it was for the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and th- that one also has a scene where, like, he... You gotta love that. You gotta love that. That's what makes Black Devil's Rotation the best. It's like, in no other movie is there going to be a scene where someone's, like, nutting so hard <laughs> that the walls <laughs> come flying down. <laughs> right. Or it's like, what, Josh, what was that, that one movie? You actually gave it to me on Blu-ray, and I can't remember the title right now, but it has a scene where someone literally gets choked by a dick. Like it's just wild oh yeah, shit. Um, welcome welcome home, um, brother Charles by Jama Fanaka. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've you've heard of him, Jason, but he he did like a bunch of sort of like L.A. underground um, kind of stuff. He, I've heard of him now. Let's get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, welcome home, brother wild, Charles. Man. It is literally a, a, a black exploitation movie about a guy who kind of weaponizes sort of like the the sort of like white insecurity about black men's genitals, and this dude has a <laughs> super sized penis that he actually uses as a weapon in the movie. Uh, it's crazy, man. And, See, and that's a revenge that's a revenge fantasy that Quentin can't even imagine doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest, like like the, the movie has a lot of almost social realism to it in like the fact that it's it's a very it's a drama about his yeah, community until suddenly it's a horror movie about what he can do with his body. <laughs> and, and, and and it 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 really goes for it. So yeah, and and, and Rudy uh, Ray Moore, I think, is is very much in that similar kind of realm where he kind of believes in this idea of making sort of like this cartoon reality of 
of the things that he sees around him and some of the, you know, he, he, the way that he wields some of the stereotypes and, you know, the language of so many different genres here. Cause again, this is, this is a comedy, but this is, I also liked doing PD Wheatstraw because this does have a horror element to it as, as well, oh, which. Absolutely. Right. I mean, the scene where the devil is talking to PD and like, Hey, you have to marry my, <laughs> my not so like attractive daughter. Is like, <laughs> <laughs> is, yeah. I mean, like that scene is like, it's the music is, you know what I mean? Like the, it's playing like loud, like the score is like really spooky and like the, yeah. like, uh, the filmmaker is not like amazing, but like it's you know that it, it looks very spooky. It literally looks like they're in hell, like making a deal, and like they're about to just like make a money deal, and it's like a <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it's, yeah. it's like, uh, like in a black void kind of thing, like it, it, like and the only thing they have is like mm-hmm. a red filter to kind of represent the the fire of hell or something like that. It's yeah, it is yeah. definitely it's got like a cheap look, but I I appreciate it's, it. It's yo, still, it's like a ghetto yo, it's like a ghetto Cronenberg low key. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ghetto. It's ghetto video. Drome, I love that. Like, you know, it's like, it's like some of the style choices are 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 pretty pretty interesting because again, as you can tell with the amount of sort of monetary limitations that they had, you know, he was experimenting with getting more ambitious with what he wanted to do with his images. In in the last, I don't know if it's, I, th- it, I think it's the last Dolomite sequel, Disco Godfather. That's the one where he does he the whole movie is him trying to do like an exorcism. Of the societal demon known as drugs, <laughs> uh, so he, so he, he tried to do a, another kind of horror element to that. But with this, he takes it to the next level. With obviously what's been sort of what's kind of laid out for you in the title, Petey Wheatstraw, who is just once again he's a he's a version of Rudy Ray Moore. He's just this stand up comic who's just the best at what he does. He's very funny. Everyone loves him, uh, and the people who don't love him, he just heckles them until they shut up. Um, yeah. and e- everyone fawns over him. He's, a- he's always, uh, moral and trying to, you know, ma- make sure that the, that the kids are doing okay. And although he really doesn't like homeless people, that's one thing that he, <laughs> he yeah, has yeah, kind of going does, against yeah. him in this one. Yeah. He does try to bury yeah, a lot of, a lot of guy. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Yeah. He does try to do that. It's like, <laughs> It's like a lot of these movies have the uh, hierarchy when it comes to class. It's very interesting, too, despite it being definitely a black movie. It has definitely a lot of hierarchy in terms of class. And like, you know, the junkies who I I shouldn't even call them junkies, the, you know, the the human beings who are trying to steal his uh, car. Uh, he's just like, God damn, I hate all you. He's like, <laughs> yeah. I hate all you junkies. Y'all the reason y'all the reason why black people can't. It's like <laughs> Yeah. And I, I don't like Yeah, and so that it's like hold up Pete, hold up too, <laughs> which is very just a lot of fun a, a lot of the time. Like I know like there's one part where he's on the uh the, the radio station and he just starts going like I am hip to dip, I am slick to rick, and he just like it, every, he has such a like a smooth way of talking that I really love and he says a lot of a lot of funny shit while he's like beating somebody up and making a little like a four line rhyme about it. It's, it's very entertaining. <laughs> yeah. His, his, his movies are very much just yeah, yeah. a re like a visual realization of like bits that he has in his act. Cause I mean, for anyone right. who doesn't know, Rudy Ray Moore actually got started as a preacher, which is maybe oh, where really? some of that sort of, uh, that, that, that orator kind of quality comes from. Well, I, yeah. I mean, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And the history of the church, the preacher was somebody who, uh, always ride with somebody who always had a voice, with someone who was always powerful with his voice, and someone who was always funny, right? And I tell you, like, growing mm-hmm. up, uh, my, my 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 aunts were really into. I'm not a I'm not a religious person, uh, if you can imagine, but <laughs> my um, my my aunts are really religious, still are really religious, and so growing up like in, in those black churches, the preacher was always somebody who you know talked could really talk their ear off and, and rhyme and be funny. And so mm-hmm. I, that, I'm not surprised that Rudy Ray Moore started with that. It's really funny that his comedy became so sexually explicit, even <laughs> yes. though he was a, he was, even though he was a preacher, but a lot of yeah. comedians started like that. I mean, I, I, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Pryor grew up in a religious family. Mm. Okay. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. I think, I think you're right. So I, I, yeah. And so, um, I, I, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's I, also a very interesting. I, part of Rudy Ray Moore's 
life. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, because, because he was he was a preacher, and then I think he became a nightclub dancer slash just sort of general nightclub entertainer, and then he eventually actually mm-hmm. joined the army, where he found his his bit that hit the best. You know, with the guys in the army, was he did country songs in kind of like this R and B style for them. And he got such a good laugh out of it that some of that actually ended up kind of becoming, you know, that's how he got into wanting to do kind of more music. And then he started doing music albums when he got home. And then he did comedy albums. He obviously came up with this Dolomite character. Um, and then the Dolomite character and the the comedy act themselves eventually turned into movies, you know, where, again, he was playing this sort of cartoonish black exploitation pimp who kind of had these raunchy rhymes in his act about, you know, sort of like hustling. And then he added in to the style, you know, some of that 70s crime grit. He, he, really, he really wanted kung fu in every single movie that he did, which is beautiful, and I love to see it. But man in Dolomite, can he not fight at all? I think in Petey Wheatstra, I found... <laughs> Found out that he uh, he actually it was the first time he used a double. He actually got a guy who did so. Oh, the, really? So some of the some of the kung fu in this actually is a little bit more it's impressive. Better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some of the, yeah some of the kung fu is a little bit better than it is a dolomite. Absolutely. That that doesn't that doesn't surprise me that he he got a double because it, it wasn't that bad. Like it, it's it's entertaining. It's definitely for sure. not. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely no. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's definitely not like once upon a time of Hollywood or anything. But it's it's you know I like uh, or any like actual. I like or any actual Bruce Lee, but right. it, it's 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 yeah, but it, it's definitely better than it was in Dolomite. Yeah, and I really like that he uses um, like the the vocalizations of Bruce Lee. Like, there's this one shot where he's like standing on a balcony, and there's a there's a, like a uh, upper angle shot of him just going over, about to kick a bunch of ass, and he's doing like the whoa, like that whole thing, <laughs> and it's just yeah. it's fantastic. I mean, I love just his his energy <laughs> in every single scene is unbelievable. Like, it's at hundred and fifty percent. Yeah, he's it's, he he he's so funny, and 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 his yeah, his I, passion I, just to be I able think... to take his, his his acts and just bring them to the screen. It, it reminds me of what we talked about a little bit when we did our John Waters episode where, you know, th- there's this kind of idea in his movies where he's, you know, he's just making a movie for a bunch of weirdos who literally are making a movie because they wouldn't fit into any kind of mainstream movie. Like the people, the things that they want to talk about, they don't make sense. Like their humor or their style or the personality, it doesn't make sense for the kind of movies that exist already. So let's just make like our own thing. And sometimes Rudy Ray Moore can get, you know, uh, so, so, some pretty goofy kind of egotistical kind of stuff going on, but it's, it's always amazing and funny and really cheap yeah. and awkward. And, it, it, it's it's very fun to watch and he it's very funny like as a comedian you you gotta just give him credit all the way even yeah. even the way he delivers some of the rhymes like this movie opens with him being like I am P. Wheatstraw, the devil's son-in-law, and he's talking about how uh, you know. Yeah, how, he's how, like he's yeah, he's like you you you've been kicking me in my sleep or whatever. He's like yeah, oh, he's yeah. like you've been bothering me in my sleep. He tells the dad or whatever. Yeah. But he's being that, born. Well, yeah, that's one of yeah. the craziest openings I've ever seen, where his mother is giving birth to P. D. Wheatstraw in the middle of a hurricane, and before P. <laughs> and obviously there's this huge cartoon like pregnant belly underneath the blanket. That's like wait, by the way, I think that's where Chappelle I think so have y'all ever seen the Chappelle show oh yeah 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 I've seen so a few episodes is that where I, I think that's where Chappelle got in the first episode of the Chappelle show right Chappelle has a skit where he's being born and he comes out he's like oh. I'm Dave Chappelle it's like I think that's where Chappelle I think that's where Chappelle got it from right I wouldn't oh, be surprised yeah. at all yeah, for sure. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's where Chappelle got us from, which is also interesting. Another c- black comedian who um, has a the way he speaks. I think all black comedians have this, right? The way that they speak is a sweet science almost. Mm. It feels poetic. Mm. It feels like something that um, was built was based off of the thing that they previously said. I think that's what I think when I listen yeah. to black comics. That's what I feel, right? I think. And I think Dolomite and Pryor and Red Fox, I think those are the people who started that. Oh man! Well, yeah, I, yeah, I love when he's yeah. just introducing you to the film in general, and he's tr- he's he's trying to talk about how uh, how good he is at sex, and the way that he <laughs> words that is, I don't mean to brag or boast, but I sit on a tombstone and produce baby ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, and I think that's what a line. That's a double up. 
that's a double entendre that you would hear in a rap song, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. That, yeah. It's like, <laughs> I, sure. I think this is literally the first this is literally the first movie that you would see that kind of just reads like a rap track like it just yeah, reads right. as like if you were to read if you were to read Dolomite and you were like read the script you would just think this is like a poem you would just think <laughs> this is like a like oh we're just rapping here you know what I mean it's yeah. like yeah it's a very it, it, it's it's a very influential way of making art and um I think you've you've seen that all over, right? Snoop Dogg has a line in Nothing But a G Thing, which is literally like one of the first songs he ever spat on, right? Because he he was so the demo tape was discovered by Dr. Dre, and then mm. he goes and does deep cover, and then Dre's like, "Yo, I'm doing a chronic. You got to come on the chronic, and we're, we're getting in the studio." And then Snoop Dogg does Nothing But a G Thing, and it's like pimping the hose and clapping the click, like my name is Dolomite. It's like you know what I mean? Like it, it yeah. that is. That is Dolomite is a precursor to a lot of gangster rap, and per- particularly Snoop Dogg, who was, I think, you know, one of the greatest rappers of all time, maybe the ten greatest rappers of all time, and probably the greatest living rapper, one of the, one of the one of them, the, one of the greatest living rappers. And so, um, it's really interesting to see. And Snoop Dogg is, is not an actor, right? He's just a rapper, right? Yeah. And so, it's really interesting to see film black representation transfer into hip hop the genre for black people. Right. And mm-hmm. so it's, 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 yeah, that's immensely interesting. Yeah. And they have yeah. the, uh, that like the imagery of the, the magic, uh, cane that's in this movie too. Like, I think I remember seeing, uh, something like that in, and I think it's a speech, it's a music video. I don't think it was Snoop Dogg's music video. I think it's 50 cent. Uh, and I think it's candy shop and they have this little interlude in the music video where they all have like a, like a, like a conference of pimps basically and like Snoop Dogg's oh, there gonna, and a bunch of the, and I'm they, and they quickly, talk about a magic pimp cane and I, and I'm just I'm thinking gonna, it must be from yeah. Rudy Ray Moore and that's just very cool to be. make that I'm connection. Gonna quickly go, I'm going to quickly go on YouTube while we continue doing this. Cause I yeah, think you're sure. right. Yeah. That's like, that's like, I, yeah, that's hilarious by the way yeah. too. It's like, yeah. It's wild. Yeah. I mean, yeah, w- w- when wild. we, when we get into like describing things that take place in this movie, if you haven't seen it, I genuinely don't think that you'll believe us for a little while. <laughs> yeah. uh, just, just some of the yeah. things that take place in this movie, because again, this opens on Rudy Ray Moore being born as a 10 year old out of his mother. He's not a baby. <laughs> right, He's a 10 year old. Have y'all seen, in, like, have, y'all seen at, have y'all seen at Astra? Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So the way he <laughs> – this is bad funny to me. I, I immediately associated this with, with Ad Astra for some reason. The way, he <laughs> jumps out of, the way he jumps out of his mother's womb is kind of like those primates in Ad Astra, the way they're just <laughs> jumping around the spaceship. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just like – I'm just like, yo, this, this six-year-old kid is just like wiling the fuck out out of his mom's womb. It's yeah, so dude, he, he, he jumps Great. out. He calls the doctor a sucker. And just starts beating on him. The doctor who just delivered him. Yeah. He's like, you want some money? The doctor's like, nah, I just want to get out of here, bro. <laughs> and then he starts beating on his dad because he says, like, he snubbed him every night for, like, nine yeah, months you're, you're, you, you, like you disturbed me every night in my sleep. He's like, I'm your daddy, boy. Like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> some great jokes. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, and it's just yeah. outrageous. I mean, it's it, you're watching a 10-year-old being birthed and then beating up the doctor and his father. is just that a joke alone. Well, yeah, and, and, is, and, and not to amazing. mention, Petey also comes out with a watermelon, too. <laughs> which right. is just even even which crazier. Which shows multiple that shit times. That is mad funny. And that's, what, and that's another thing that I, I, I... That's another, like, idea of Dolomite is the flipping of stereotypes on its ass. Right, right, yeah, right. Like absolutely. The the yeah. the watermelon coming out, and it doesn't... And we're going to talk about a bamboozle uh, uh, later on. But what's interesting is what you see in bamboozle is that it's a negative thing, right? It's mm-hmm. like bamboozle try to make the argument, I think, that you can't really flip your stereotypes on your ass. I think that's mm-hmm. what kind of one of the arguments that I think Spike is making. Whereas in Dolomite, he actually succeeds in doing that kind of, right? It's like yeah. the um, Dolomite is also one of the – I think Dolomite would probably be one of the first uh, instances of black people are using nigger. Right. It's mm-hmm. like you don't mm-hmm. really see that. You didn't really see that a lot. And they started doing that. And then like it's now become a big thing in hip hop. And like right. you would see you don't I think 
if you would contrast that to a Spike movie, you wouldn't see that a lot, right? Yeah, and yeah, because I, I, I think I, I think Spike, and we'll get into it when we do Bamboozled, he definitely sees that, like, even when black artists try to subvert it, there is on some level an audience that is always will- not willing to engage with it on that kind of level. Yes, I think, right. yes, I think, yeah. I think that's what he's going, going for. There's always going to be, there's, yeah, there's always going to be a, a particular audience, uh, uh, a, a white audience that will look at that and will use it to just continue their narrative of what black people are like or what black artists like mm-hmm. or what their relationship with black artists. Yeah, and, 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 and so Rudy Ray Moore, you kind of see him, obviously, as you mentioned, kind of like reclaiming it through comedy by being taking yeah. it to such, uh, such an absurd level. Like, like again, a young black boy, Petey Wheatstraw, being born 10 years old, already holding a watermelon on his way out the womb. Like, that's so already absurd sla- and so already crazy. Already slapping the shit out of his, already <laughs> slapping the shit out of his dad. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? Like, like that type of like that type of behavior, that type of like ghetto behavior, like you know what I mean? Like it's something that it's it's reclaiming that and it's representing that in a way that uh, you know absurdism, right? Is ridiculousness with context, right? I, I read yeah. that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think it's 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 making it look. It's making uh, his art be ridiculous, but with the idea of. No, I'm owning up to this. Yeah, well, yeah, isn't isn't this idea cri- like ridiculous in the first yeah, place right. almost? Because I mean, like he he eventually incorporates the watermelon back again when he gets beat up by like a like a bunch of kids as a boy, and there just happens to be like some karate master walking by, watching him get beat up, and he gets to do like you know like the whole training montage where this dude teaches him kung fu, and, and but not just kung fu, he also teaches him self respect, and he gives That's him right. a samurai sword, and what is he doing? He's he's chopping up the watermelon with the samurai sword which right. is another just like ridiculous kind of yeah you know, and, and image. I, I, I i you know this movie actually has more context and more nuance than we than we imagine it to be right because like he comes out with the watermelon but then this guy's teaching him self-respect and he's like cutting the watermelon in half with a samurai <laughs> like, sword too and then so crazy. Samurai sword, like a symbol of, a symbol of like gentleman qualities and a symbol of peace and like yeah. this and that and so it's it's like it's. I think kung, kung fu is, you know, inherently um, humorous in this movie, but also kung fu is supposed to be a type of thing that you do like in reverence of, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you see that in Kill Bill a lot, where it's kung fu is very reverent, it's very serious, it's very solemn, and I think um, <laughs> it's really interesting to, to see that in Dolomite, where it's just a like comedy, and they're like just like making it's like kung fu is supposed to be making people laugh, and so it's yeah. it's. I think it's a very nuanced portrayal of the, the idea of blackness and the idea of self-representation and how you are to the world. Mm-hmm. Well, I, 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 I love too that again, because he, he picks up on some of that seriousness and you know, he, he, he gets trained in this art and also he flips that on his head on a joke as well, because the first thing out of his mouth when he finishes his training and he, he knows Kung Fu and he knows self-respect, he's like, I've just always wanted to be a stand-up comedian. That's it. He tells his master that. His master's like, well, all right, uh, you can do that. Um, and he gives him the one rule, though, which is that you never bow to to any other man. You got to be like the biggest guy in the room. And he, he incorporates that into his act. And we see his act. And his act is hilarious because... I, I honestly couldn't like his act was just making fun of people in the room. Like that was it. <laughs> yeah. Like, it like, like I think the only joke insult, the only joke we see him say is that, that there, there's a woman who has a giant ass and he says to her, <laughs> if a fire broke out in this club right now and you had to haul ass, you'd have to make 10 trips. <laughs> and the dude beside her is like, Hey man, you can't talk to my woman like that. And what does he say? He just says, shut up. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think yeah. He, he also threatens yeah. a, a dude to beat. He says that he's going to beat his ass with a, another lady's boob or something. Yeah, he's, yeah. Like, he's like, if you say one more word, I'm going to take that lady's titties and I'm going to beat the <laughs> shit out of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the most crazy threats I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, well, and, and, and then that's it. That's the end of his act. He goes, "Good night, everybody." Yeah, like he literally just <laughs> he, you know, he literally a, just it, it, made fun it, of people legit, and threatened it's legit, them. Like it's school. It's school. Yard, it's schoolyard yeah. like <laughs> insults. You right. know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 that that kicks off uh sort of like a larger story where he has these comedy rivals, uh Leroy and Skillet, 
who have just sort of borrowed a large sum of money, presumably from some sort of mob finance uh, backed uh, white man. And they decide that they are going to open up, you know, sort of like a, some sort of comedy club. But then they find out that Petey, uh, Rudy Ray Moore's Petey Wheatstra, has an engagement in L.A. already. And obviously, as we just saw, he's the best at comedy. And everyone, every person is going to love to go and get heckled like that. <laughs> um, so, so, so they're very worried about competition and that their new business isn't going to work out. And of, like, like every other person would do in some sort of, you know, you know, you have a, a situation where there's, there's a booking conflict, you know, Jamie, I'm sure that you've probably heard something like that being in music mm-hmm. that, you know, th- there's just, there's two acts playing at the same time. It kind of sucks. It's a problem. So oh, yeah. what do you do? You massacre, uh, <laughs> you kill a child first. Yeah, that's how we got our you, first gig in my band. Yeah. You just killed a child. They're yeah, like, you all right, do good to go. do in this industry, man. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and you would think that it would be like, you know, because I, I think they just say, go rough them up, is all they say. Yeah, yeah. And and, and the guys go over and they, they go to rough up, you know, sort of like his business partner, um, Rudy Ray Moore's business partner, and they accidentally end up shooting his brother in cold blood, and the way mm-hmm, that it actually yeah. focuses on this kid, like, bleeding out and dying is like really horrible. Yeah, he's got especially, blood coming out of his mouth and like the big wound yeah. in his stomach. It's it's pretty uh, sad, actually. Especially after the scene where he just like beat up a bunch of the local kids for trying to like strip his car, and yeah. the, there's like Benny Hill like speed ramping and shit going on. Like it, like it's absolute cartoon shit of him with the father and son on the porch eating watermelon as well. Like just for an added stereotypical joke that he keeps like throwing at you, and in the, in the, in the <laughs> and, and, and then he, and then he's gonna kill that the kid, kid right yeah. in front of you, and it's then crazy. and and you think that you know there's gonna be some sort of joke there's about people, it, like, but there's not. Screaming too when it happens, there's yeah. People, like, screaming out when it happens. Yeah, too. the whole it's neighborhood like like, <laughs> like surrounds him and then mourns the child, and it's just like th- yeah, there's a lot of uh, tonal switches just in that those like five minutes. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it went, goes from a watchy comedy to like do the right thing. It's very, just, like, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just very jarring. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's very funny. Absolutely. It's very funny and very jarring. Yeah. Well, because 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 then it's then it's cut to like a funeral where he's carrying like Petey Wheatstraw is carrying the kid's casket out of the church, and he's got like tears going down his face, and then there is like a straight up like gangster movie level massacre on the fucking people at the funeral where like the the dudes from the comedy club just pull out tommy guns and just shoot them all and there's like blood squibs and everything going off as like you know yeah. like the the kid's grandma is there being shot Petey's being shot Petey's you know yeah. friend is being shot it's everyone is just being shot and and it's so crazy that you're like this is a turf war between like comedy club bookers. yeah that's right. like something like, <laughs> yeah that's like something that would happen on Boardwalk Empire too. Like that's yeah. not even something that would. Yeah, that's not even something that happens in The Godfather or like Menace of Society. That's something yeah. that happens on HBO. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like yeah. it's just it's it, it's very a lot of total switches here by Rudy Ray Moore. I love it. That's yeah, and this like. is all all in like the first half and half an hour because this is yeah. what sets just the movie up because we haven't even got to the the crazy shit where he dies, he goes down to hell, and he is brought back to life. Um, by Satan, again, in sort of like this glowing red and black void. Uh, If, though, only if, he will agree to marry Satan's ugly daughter and give him a grandchild because no one wants to get married to Satan's daughter. So he has to give him a grandchild, and if he does, you know, he'll give him the magic pimp cane and let him get revenge on everything that happened. That presence is actually, like, that, like, premise... I think is actually hilarious. Just it's like crazy. the idea. It's really crazy. It's just like, how would you marry my daughter that nobody really fucks with? It's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just like I also it's, the way that it's they just portray- like the weirdest thing. Like Oh yeah. The way that they portray the the devil is interesting too, because at first he's just kinda got like this this like white beard. And then as it goes, he turns into almost like a like a Dracula type character. He's got like a cape with with red beneath it, and and uh, like uh, he's got I, he does have like the devil horns. But then he then he, it seems like his beard honestly grows as this movie this movie goes. Like he becomes Ideally, more. Uh, I, I don't I, know. 
Like this, his costume gets like more flamboyant as it goes. Ideally, if hell was, if hell is real, ideally the devil looks like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ideally speaking, like you, you know what I yeah, mean? The, the, like, the, 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 the devil in this movie, um, he he's he's nice. He's actually, right. you know, he he, yeah, he, make, he makes he makes cool like he he, yeah. he he makes like fair deals, and actually, it's Petey Wheatstraw who, who screws uh, is, it up. Yeah, yeah, who, who who screws it up? He's Who's the one like, who makes yeah, a deal yeah. with him and then backs out on the deal. But like, Usually there was nothing. It's the devil, right? Usually, it's the devil's like, oh, I'll, you know, sign the contract, and then he does a little sneaky thing. But this time, it was just Petey not fulfilling the contract that he signed. Well, yeah, he <laughs> sees the he sees the daughter, and Petey's like, oh hell no, <laughs> which is so <laughs> funny. Just imagine die, imagine saying. saying he he literally says hell no hell no <laughs> to the devil um when yeah. when because because he's like what does she look like and he's like well you know i don't i don't think it should matter what she looks like uh pd <laughs> uh but he, but he but he but he gives him a picture of his daughter and rudy ray moore oh my god when he goes hell nah kill me man <laughs> yeah just, <laughs> just keep keep me me. Yeah, i'm, I'm yeah, staying yeah. here keep me right here <laughs> oh man it's great yeah, but then, but then he's you know he he eventually does agree to it, but with the idea that you know he's gonna trick the devil. He's he's gonna get the devil's magic powers, get his revenge, and he's gonna work out a plan to not have to marry the devil's daughter. You know, uh, sort of on the fly. That's kind of like his plan. Yeah. So we, we get sort of like this reversal of time where they go back and the the funeral massacre is undone. But I was weirded out that the kid's death wasn't undone. <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah, they just we won't go back that the far. funeral. <laughs> <laughs> we can only yeah. do like the last 20 minutes and, and and all of his friends don't believe that he's back and everything and they're like dude you you made a deal with the devil like that's fucked up right they're like you know if, if you cross him he's gonna be mad as hell i think is what they say at one point yeah and all the henchmen start to like that go after him start to get all freaked out because they thought they killed him and i think at one point he makes one yes. of the henchmen like piss and shit himself in an alleyway or something <laughs> yes. <laughs> like he's yeah. just such a powerful being it's, well yeah oh, and, and, and and not only that because rudy ray moore is such a such a mean comedian he has that guy go back to and be like no i swear to god i saw pd wheatstra you don't understand like it's he, he's for real. He's back. He's a ghost, even though I fucking killed him. I don't understand. But no yeah. one can listen to him because he smells so bad because he shit and piss himself <laughs> everywhere. So he goes back to the hideout and all the hen- like one of the henchmen in the room listening to him literally just faints from the smell. And they're <laughs> right. like, dude, just get the fuck out of here. <laughs> we yeah. don't need the warning. <laughs> oh man yeah it's good stuff yeah. Uh, it's, meanwhile it's, it's, Petey, Petey Wheatstraw is literally just he, all he's doing is just getting revenge there's a part like where he goes into the rival comedy club in like a really shitty disguise like it's just very clearly <laughs> Petey Wheatstraw in like a hat and yeah. <laughs> he's just yeah, like let great. me in and they, they let him in because he's gonna sabotage their comedy show because they obviously killed him so that their comedy show could go and it would be successful and he starts using the devil's pimp cane to, you know, sort of like start messing with the singer's voice and then start tearing mm-hmm. clothes off the band members. He starts like making it snow. There actually is a pretty like effective horror moment where like he starts destroying the venue and there's like flashes of like Satan's like bleeding eyes uh, oh, yeah. being interspliced into the footage of him like destroying the the venue and accessing the devil's powers obviously to get get his revenge and everything like that. There's also like a part where I think the cane like senses that there's like a bomb in a bathroom. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and and he just goes over to the bathroom and he everyone Yo, I starts think like that Kane. I think that Kane has like spidey sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that's <laughs> absolutely what he uses it for. And they start playing like hot potato with the bomb while some girl in the background is giving like a really shitty like audition for his club, which is funny because it's a scene that's actually also in Bamboozled, where they're auditioning like a bunch of band people for the show, uh, oh, yeah. and they right. some of them are are better than other ones. But Rudy Raymore <laughs> is so ruthless; she starts getting up in there and singing. And he goes, "Damn, who the hell is this bitch?" Is <laughs> yeah. all he says. <laughs> And then he's playing a hot potato with this bomb that the cane senses. And then he, I think he ends up throwing that bomb at the watermelon salesman and blowing up all of the watermelon watermelon. in the back of his truck. (laughs) Somehow, somehow Rudy Ray Moore put in four 
hilarious watermelon gags somehow well and and and, and literally blowing them up is so funny though as oh the, yeah like the, so the, the watermelon like literally like hits kids on the streets it like hits the traffic cop like the whole neighborhood like sees it there's like some and some really classic comedy cutaways and stuff like this while he's doing some of these set pieces it's also similar to that thing we were talking about with the samurai sword how he was cutting the watermelon he's kind of like cutting the stereotype but like at this one he just he throws dynamite it at up. it and explodes <laughs> it like yeah. just a crazy <laughs> out it's great oh man it's like the spoofs in this movie are even funnier or just as funny as like the jokes are just like funny as the line readings it's just like oh yeah watching the yeah like the watching the visuals comedy. yeah the physical comedy is great and that's it's not giving no credit in black exploitation just how rate how much range the comedy has in these movies right mm-hmm. there it's not only funny because of the slang and the culture it's also funny because the physical comedy is always great in black Sensation films <laughs> it's like yeah i love it i love it yeah i mean i yeah. i love that bit when he you know because he, he he ends up getting the revenge on the comedy club and the devil is trying to like make you know be like okay now you have to honor your end of the arrangement and he keeps just trying to like delay that but while <laughs> yeah. he's delaying that, he's using his magic pimp cane like in the community, and the way he sees it, you know, like he's he he is helping, um, right. you know, the community use by granting them wishes, and he like turn he 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 turns a man into a dog because his mom saw, caught him like cheating on his girlfriend or something like that, and he was just like he's a dog, and so he turns wife. him into a dog, and then they, she's, <laughs> the mom picks him up and is like I'm gonna take <laughs> care of him. Dog. Feed him dog food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a dog. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and the, that uh, so funny. His, his mistress or his girlfriend or whoever it is it has like the most crazy facial expressions as she's screaming. Like it's incredibly animated and cartoonish, which I really like too. And she even runs away doing like the cartoon waving arms thing where you like put them in the air and wave them back and forth as if you're a cartoon character. So it's, it's I, I like that uh, all the physical comedy and it's very over well, yeah, the top and, and at times he, too. He uses the cane to start stop a car from running over some kids like playing in the streets and when when he finishes like saving these kids he just starts like combing the kids hair he just pulls like a comb out of his suit and just starts oh, yeah, combing yeah. the kids yeah. hair, the yeah. kids hair for, and, and the kids are like freaking out being like who the fuck the is this man like, touching us the kids, <laughs> even crying. the kids like i don't want this at all yeah. rudy ray yeah. Morris just like nope we're we're helping out we're helping the community yeah. here that yo that shit reminded me man when i was a kid my when i was a kid like my i was i like when i was a kid i would never go to to go and get haircuts like my hair was nappy (laughs) as fuck my hair was nappy as fuck when i was a kid and so like my aunts and uh would like try to pick out my hair and i was was like no like that that type of like yeah so you live that moment (laughs) yeah i live that yeah i live that yeah i live that so I, yeah. I related to those kids a lot. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and, and the kids are, like, crying while he's doing it. But he, the way he sees it, again, he's doing, like, uh, he's he's doing a, a service. Because for him, it's it's one of those things where it's, like, he's using this sort of genre language to create these satires where the, the, the issues of his community can be solved by, like, some handsome, hilarious badass who is uh, the, <laughs> the, the best at sex, uh, which, right. which just has to be stressed at every moment uh, that, that, that yeah, there can be. Like- being being good at sex is something that is clear it's clearly something that Rudy Ray more like wants people to know in his art <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. it's very important virtue it's like very important it's a very important virtue for him it's like PD Dolomite these two men can fuck and it's like that is like the that is like the idea of like these black rotation films it's like all these men in these movies they fuck <laughs> absolutely like that's yeah like that's it <laughs> But yeah, man, like that that montage where he's just he's just using the magic to kind of help out his community, and it starts like raining money, and there's like slow mo shots of it falling from the sky, and Rudy Ray Moore's like giant grin grin while this like joyous funk song called like Ghetto Street USA is kind of yeah, like playing just and stuff dancing like that. Dancing down the street, the vibe is amazing. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, but the, but oh, eventually he needs to confront Satan because Satan is like, you made a deal with me, you got to marry my daughter. He, he's having like telephone calls back and forth with Satan. Satan's like answering the phone in the tub and stuff like that, which is just yeah. solid visual gag. Uh, but but he tells Satan, you know, look, I need I can't get married yet because I gotta meditate. 
you know, and he uses that Satan again, being very agreeable and very nice. Actually, is like, yeah, whatever, all right, take take some time to meditate. But you're going to marry my daughter Same. in a couple days. <laughs> That's why, uh, if, when editors when editors ask me for the piece that I owe them, it's like I have to meditate first. And then I'll, I'll <laughs> <laughs> They're like, all right, but 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 what does he do? He uses that meditation time to develop a Mission Impossible face mask of himself, <laughs> way before Mission Impossible. And oh yeah, in the in the third one, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And they and, and they, they use a. I think it's like a. I don't know if he's homeless, but he's like a drunk it's, it's guy a hom- they find on yeah, the street. Yeah, it, 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 it's a homeless guy. They call him uh, a, a wino because it's okay, kind of like right. a like a homeless guy who's who's frequently drunk on like drunk. cheap alcohol and things like that. And Rudy Ray Moore definitely was like, "I'm just gonna take a random homeless man, put my face on him, get him all alcoholed up so he doesn't know which way is up, and then we'll put him in the back of the car uh, when the <laughs> and devil he'll shows marry up." The devil's daughter. <laughs> Yeah, and no one, no one will, you know, Rudy, think anything of that. Rudy Ray, Moore, Rudy Ray Moore and homelessness is like Tina Fan's sex work. It's their blind, it's their, it's their blind spots. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 I'm like, damn, Rudy. And it's so funny because he he definitely comes across like m- like poorer. Or um, like like more in the wrong in this situation than Satan does because the scenes right, of Satan yeah, during yeah. all of this are like him jogging around town like waving at everyone. Everyone's like, "Hey, Satan!" Like, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Satan's <laughs> like Satan's like the dude that yes, he's gonna screw you over, but you got to sign up for it in this movie. He's just yeah. kind of like, I think "I'm a good Satan, guy, otherwise, uh, just don't sign Satan, my contract." <laughs> Satan and God had like a falling out. But like <laughs> Satan's kind of a good dude. It's yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> it's like Satan was like using God's bathroom or whatever, and God well, was like, "Hey, yeah. you can't do that." <laughs> yeah, we gotta hear both sides. <laughs> this, yeah, and, and, and gotta this hear was, both sides. Yeah, and this was when I knew that I loved the movie. But like a good example of that is Satan throwing him a bachelor party with a bunch of sexy demons. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. My favorite detail of this is all the times that Rudy Ray Moore just looks back into directly into the camera and the big smile he has on his face. <laughs> like he just I oh felt like God, the director so was funny. honestly like, Rudy, don't look at the camera, but he just couldn't help himself. He's like, guys, look what I'm doing. This is incredible. <laughs> he, he's literally <laughs> having an orgy with like 20 <laughs> demons from hell that all have like little tiny horns on their head and are all naked. It's and- so, yo, I, by the way, I think you're right. I think the beard got bigger. Yeah, it did. I'm, like it watching, I'm like watching highlights on my phone a little bit. The beard definitely gets bigger from the opening scene <laughs> and to yeah. the scene where the scene where the guy's getting beat up on the brick wall and Satan's like laughing. The yeah. beard is mad <laughs> big, bro. <laughs> it's where he draws his power. Well, yeah, from, and in, I think. In, in, in the very last scene, he looks like Ten Commandments level shit. Right? Uh, yeah, he's got like, the like, 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 beard. like when they're on the rooftop. Yeah. Definitely. No, his beard definitely. I mean, it's, it's definitely like Rudy Ray Moore is like just, you know, he's messing with him. He's he's making him have to go like bad devil mode. He's like, I, I want to be the good devil who just, you know, jogs around and has fun with everyone and, you know, makes makes deals that people honor. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and he's like, look, he, he even gives them, you know, like a, like a giant orgy, which cut frequently cuts back to like zoom ins and zoom outs on like a portrait of the devil watching Rudy Ray Moore have sex yeah. and being very impressed by that. Also my, um, one of my favorite shots is when it's just Rudy Ray Moore and you see his upper torso and all you see is like eight pairs of legs just hanging in the <laughs> air. In the air. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and afterward, all of the demons are just like wide eyed. Like he basically <laughs> like fucks them all into comas somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and like they're, they're all just beat dead. They're tired and he just puts his suit back on and he's like all right that was fun that now was go to go back on to the next thing and then dick, satan yeah dick satan, so bomb dick so bomb you're unconscious yeah, <laughs> yeah like, and then the devil finds out about the homeless man in the mask and P- sends like demons to fight P- him and so pd is so good at sex that the demons are literally like Sleeping, yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. Fucked into a like coma. they just <laughs> fucked into like concussions and shit. It's like mad, yo, that shit is, yo, it's mad funny, man. Like that's oh, a pre- so good. yo, they like they, it's like legitimately like the promise of the black man is has been is a <laughs> is a negative connotation in American history, right? When it comes to um, you know uh, real life in in, right. in America and the way people 
the stereotypes of black men and how that was used to weaponize us in terms of uh, uh, the law when it comes to dealing with with white women. And Mm -hmm. in this movie, it flips it around and and it's like, yeah, we fuck. Let's get it. (laughs) It's it's so funny. Bring in, bring in, bring in more sexy demon ladies. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. But yeah, then, 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 you know, Satan does find out about, you know, how he tried to do the switcheroo with the homeless man. Uh, it's f- so funny how fast that whole thing falls apart. Like the homeless dude just takes the mask off within like 30 <laughs> seconds of being in the back of the car. And they're all like, what the fuck? And yeah. then he starts getting into Kung Fu, various Kung Fu fights with <laughs> all of Satan's demons that they send after him. <laughs> he, he, he does one in like a, um, in like a, uh, it, in the club, obviously, in, in his club where they come after him and he fights them, and they they right. basically just have horns and like dollar store capes on, yeah, uh, and like different <laughs> like colored that. leotards. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, then there's another fight scene that takes place like outside, and there was one part in this that kind of uh, threw me off for a second, where uh, I don't know if you guys spotted it, but there's graffiti on the wall at one point that says yeah. Lil Wayne. I wrote that down too. I always, yeah, really? I, yeah, yeah. It, it, I always it was, it was little... huge. I, I couldn't not notice it, and I was like, "Is is is this another relationship thing between Rudy Ray Moore and hip hop?" Yeah, Did Lil I Wayne get his name. Wayne... I think. Well, Lil Wayne's name is Dwayne Carter, so right. probably not. But like, <laughs> it's such a <laughs> weird coincidence. Be, yeah, that's such a weird coincidence, though. It's like it's like one of those coincidences that make you believe in like magic or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> if, if, you, if yeah, you go back yeah. and pull it up during one of the scenes where Rudy Ray Moore is doing kung fu against the the demons. <laughs> You will just see in giant letters on the back wall during the fight scene, just Lil Wayne graffitied on the wall. Yeah, it's, I mean it, that it's is also bizarre. that is also a rapper who you can really trace the lineage from Dolomite to him, right? Like I think there's two regions of rap in particular that owe Dolomite: mm-hmm. West Coast and Southern hip hop. Okay. Those in particular yeah. owe, owe Dolomite, whereas East Coast hip hop owes crime movies, right? Or mm-hmm. Wu Tang, Wu Tang owes a lot of uh, um, uh, kung fu, uh, uh, Asian flicks, a lot of Asian yeah. movies. Yeah. But like, also, but also, also a lot of crime movies, and like Jay Z owes owes a lot of crime movies. Biggie, a lot of crime movies, right? East Coast is like crime movies. Southern hip hop and West Coast are very, I think, black exploitation and dolomite style. And so yeah. it, it, it it's, I I could you know you could totally see Lil Wayne being influenced by something like that. Yeah, I mean, who knows that even I, I heard that like because I know I knew his name was was Dwayne. So, you know, Lil Wayne isn't the, the biggest stretch, but I did think that he was named Lil Wayne from his elders. So it's possible that they knew about the movie. And maybe <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like such a Yo, bizarre I would, coincidence. I would love I would love to find out that Birdman is really, really into black exploitation. <laughs> hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> that would amazing. rule so hard. That would rule so hard if Birdman is like an expert in Dolomite. He's like yeah. a Rudy Ray Moore expert Birdman. Yeah, we got <laughs> We got to get Birdman on the show to do the sequel. I got to I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pit, I'm gonna pitch something. I'm going to pitch something to uh, uh, so I can interview Birdman. I'll definitely ask him this. Like, hell yeah. <laughs> definitely. Let awesome. us know. No. Let yes, us know. please. <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah, we're basically at the end of this movie, but like at at the very end here, when when he he fights, you know, he fights off a bunch of Satan demons doing kung fu. Again, the the kung fu is uh, very uh, it's it's more accomplished than some of his previous films, but it's definitely very awkwardly done. But man, it's just fun to watch a guy who's like, you know what? Fuck you! I'm doing kung fu in my movie. I don't care what you say. I don't yep. care how it looks. I don't care if I'm fighting a bunch of dudes in like dollar store capes and leotards. Um, <laughs> that's that's what's gonna happen. I want to fight. I want to kung fu fight the devil. Um, and he eventually weakens Satan like with his cane. And again, introducing another rhyme. I think he said something like, "No heartache and pain, but I'm gonna destroy your ass with your own walking cane." <laughs> 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 and he literally lights the devil on fire, combusting him, and throws him off the roof. Yeah. Uh, and you just you just watch the devil on fire fall to his death. And Rudy Ray Moore is so pleased with himself. He's like, yeah, I just killed the devil. He's, he's dead. And he goes all the way down uh, to the street level. He gets in the car thinking he's getting in the car with his friends. 
and he finds out that he got into the wrong car. And I love the cutaway because, you know, all, he's always got room for a joke. But he cuts to the other car that was on, like, the other side of the street. Like, it was literally <laughs> if he just crossed the street, he would have got into the right car. <laughs> and and his friends are like, yo, I think he got in the wrong car. Like, what is he doing over there? And he got in the car mm. with the devil and the devil's daughter. And man, just a zoom in on his mouth as Rudy Ray Moore just screams at the top of his lungs. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And, and then that awesome Petey Wheatstraw theme song plays. So I just Petey love that Wheatstraw. it has that like kind of that horror <laughs> comedy twist. And then it goes right back into the awesome funky tune that's Petey Wheatstraw's theme song. Yeah. A great yeah, tonal change man. there too. It's great. It's terrific. It's like, yeah, no. By the end of the awesome. scene, the beard is so long. Holy shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Satan's so power huge. comes from that white beard for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. yeah it's such a good movie. What a, what, a, what a picture. What a quality picture. Marvin Schwartz would have loved that. What a, what a picture. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> pivoting towards, I think, reductive rating around here, uh, Jason, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but it's where we remove all the words and all the nuance and reduce the movie between a number between one and five. But it's also become sort of final statements. If there's any lines or scenes or anything we didn't get to, we also bring them up here. But for me, Petey Wheatstraw is a, is, is a very solid four, maybe, maybe even pretty close to a high four, because it is my favorite of what I've seen of um, Rudy Ray Moore. I think that there is just mm-hmm. something... Uh, very accomplished uh, for for him in terms of what he what his ambitions are as a filmmaker, what he's going for. The fact that he is able to layer in so many gags um, and so many ridiculous genre elements that all serve to just make this as fun a movie as it could possibly be. Uh, it, 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 he, he is unparalleled, I think, at, at doing something like that. And we've, we've kind of went over it all already, but like, you know, the, just the fact that we're talking about a movie where like a rival comedy club booking bureaucratic issue turned into a gangster movie massacre, which then turned into a <laughs> deal with the devil to give him a magic pimp cane to get ref- revenge on the rival comedy club. So, and also a subplot about marrying the devil's daughter who is ugly and he doesn't want to do. And then he's having orgies with, with demons. And like, if you just broke down things that (laughs) happened in this movie, it's insane. And the fact that it came, you know, out of his head and it's as funny as it is. And it works as frequently as it does, I think is a, a huge credit to him as an actor and a writer and a filmmaker in general. So yeah, Pee Wee Straw, solid four for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm, um, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm four yeah. star. I don't have, I don't really have much to add. I just, I love uh, Rudy Ray Moore's energy. His comedy stylings is I think hilarious. I love how aggressive he is as well. I'm, I'm curious if he has, does he have any uh, stand up comedy? Do you know about that? Uh, I, I don't think so. I've seen any, but maybe that maybe there is something out there. I don't I don't know that. I think he was a uh, pre when they started like actually recording stand up in like the eighties, like it, when it became more frequent and popular to do that. So okay. I, I don't know that he had his. I mean, there's definitely albums of comedy. Yeah, there's um, definitely albums. I don't know if there's like video like there. Ha- like I, I don't prior, think there's video. Like, yeah, now. yeah. I don't think there's any video like Pryor has or, or Red Fox has, but I think there's like a, al- there's definitely albums. Okay. Um, or, I might listen uh, uh, that platform. Cause I'd just oh, yeah. be curious to see him like, like I, I love these, these movies that he's coming up with. I mean, I've also seen Dolomite and I loved that, but I would love to see him just on a stage or I guess hear him on a stage completely raw and just interacting with people for an hour. I bet that is a, yeah. an absolute trip. So, uh, but yeah. yeah, this is a four out of five for me and I'm, oh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it. There, there actually more. is uh, recordings out there, but I, I can't find people who have actually logged them. So they might be lost. But okay. I, I, I have, looking at his uh, letterbox page, there are, uh, like, live stand-up shows. One of them filmed by Cliff Rockmore, the director here. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I'll have to check some yeah. of that out. But, yeah, four out of five for me. This was awesome. Yeah, I think this is his best movie. I, 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 I yeah, I think this is the best thing they've done. And conceptually, it's, like, the best filmmaking they've done. It's really still really, really funny. They're going for a lot of different genres, a lot of different things. Um, I would also give it a four out of five. I think it's I think it's a riot. I think it was I think it's terrific, man. Oh, yeah. I was the scene they're on the roof and he's like beating all the demons with like a baseball bat. Like what is that thing he's holding? <laughs> is it the cane? Oh, no, I, 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 th- I think it's the cane. 
Is yeah, I think cane? that's okay. the cane. That's okay. the magic cane. <laughs> it's the magic cane. He's just like fighting off ten different people like it's old boy. Like I think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, like, that's great. I, oh man, I think it's really really funny. And um, I, 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 again, just the. It's a very daring film. I love mm-hmm. works of art. I love works of art that is daring. I love works of art that tries to flip things on its ass. I love works of art that is rooted in the history of America and the history of race in America or fascism or any type of any type of ills that we have and you have do- you have Rudy Ray Moore who is flipping a lot of those stereotypes and a lot of those damaging things and using it in a way to make humor. And I think that's literally what comedy is all about. If you were yeah. to ask me, if you were to ask me why they invented comedy, it is to spoof real life things that have caused people ills and caused the world pain. I think that is what comedy is based off of. And I think I don't know. There's not a lot of people who have done that better than Rudy Ray Moore did. And I think that you see that in P. We draw a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and I don't honestly think anyone had more fun making movies, honestly, <laughs> yeah. than yeah. he yeah. did. Like on I the screen, that- like like I like I think about those shots that Jamie mentioned, where he he literally can't stop himself in the orgy scene from looking down the lens and being <laughs> like, "I'm Rudy Ray Moore, bitch." I'm doing like, this. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing I'm it. fucking yeah, I, thirty I, demons I, right I, now. <laughs> I wish I wish that this movie was in um, was talked about more in uh, Dolomite is my name in the biopic. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I like the biopic a lot, by the way. I don't know about y'all. I thought it was very good. I enjoyed I it, it yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was well done. I thought Eddie, I thought Eddie was incredible in it. But um, gets all the cadences right and, and gets all the, the spirit of what Rudy B. Moore was trying to do. He gets that right. But I yeah, wish it, that they it, put, it, it definitely got that quality that like Ed Wood had, where like it, it, it was a bunch of passionate friends and weirdos who got together and were like, "We're just gonna make this thing. We don't care what anybody thinks." Yes, and the movie yes. definitely got that aspect of it right. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely got that right. And I, um, I, I think I wish that they had done a scene in that movie where it was like it was them filming this because this is like the craziest thing to me. So <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I think that will wrap it up for P.D. Wheatstraw. We're going to be right back, and we're going to be talking about bamboozle. I'm out. I'm raising up. We all have that sound left. When are you going to come into the light? The light. The light. Your hands are just as bloody as mine. Cousins, I want you all to go to your windows. We talking about revolution. Go to your windows and yell out. I am not going to take it anymore. I don't want anything to do with anything black for at least a week. All right, we are back and we are talking Bamboozled, the 2000 American satirical comedy drama film written and directed by uh, Spike Lee. Where to start with uh, Bamboozled and... (laughs) And, and I, I mean, I guess maybe we can start with, uh, Spike a little bit, maybe, maybe in general here. I mean, this, yeah, this, this movie, the first time it, it, we've covered him besides the four, the, uh, Defy Bloods. Yes. This is other than doing a bonus transmission on Defy Bloods. This is the only time that we've talked Ooh, about Spike. I haven't heard, show. I haven't heard you two talk about that. I really like Defy Bloods. I haven't heard you two talk we, about that. We liked it a lot. Yeah. We did a, yeah, we did good. a long recording on it for, in the, in the bonus transmission where we talk about new movies and yeah, no, we, we liked it a lot. I think we also ended up putting it on like our top three or four genre movies of, mm. of last yeah, year. It was in my top um, 10 somewhere. I can't remember where, but it was, it was, de- there. It was definitely um, in there. Well, but, but this movie is sort of a culmination of a lot of thoughts that oh, Spike yeah. Lee had and and a lot of frustrations that he had in in the movie industry. I mean, at this point, you know, he he had been hot off um shit. 
uh, Malcolm X would have been not even 10 years ago. It would have been 92, right? So uh, he, he did Malcolm X, and apparently he started conceiving this movie around the time that he was making Malcolm X during the downtime where he was having trouble finding funding for that film. Because he was like, how am I having trouble finding f- funding for a Malcolm X film starring Denzel Washington? I so, think, um, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, he had to ask Magic Johnson to like help fund the film. Yeah, yeah, he, he had to go oh, and get wow. parts of it independently funded, um, and, and he had to beg to just get it at all. They wanted it directed by, like, Norman Jewison, I think, and Spike was like, no, 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 no. If you're going to make a Malcolm X movie, like, I'm going to be making that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Eddie, it, it worked. Is, I mean, he got this it. This is un- unrelated to Bamboozle, but greatest biopic of all time, I think, is Malcolm X easily for me. It's absolutely one of my favorites. What an incredible yeah. movie. Yeah. I, there's still few things that have as much impact on me as a film watcher as like that last hour of that movie does. And yeah. it's also yeah. one of the faster three hour movies I think that you can watch just the and way that it's structured. A lot of that is a lot of that's because of Denzel. Like the fury that Denzel plays. Denzel looks nothing like Malcolm X. I hope people know that. Like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, re- it's, re- it's very, very funny to me. Malcolm X was shown to me. A lot of Spike's. We're, we'll, we'll get to we'll get it. one of the reasons why I'm very excited to talk about Spike is like I have a very as I spoke about uh, uh, in the first half I have a very personal relationship with Spike other than um, you know the Goodfellas and the Casinos and the Godfathers and uh, the Chinatowns and the rest of the movies that I kind of just like went on Wikipedia and was like what are the greatest movies and like <laughs> just started watching them like as a kid Spike movies were shown to me by like my parents. So mm. I have like I have like a personal relationship to a lot of Spike movies. I can remember where I was when I first watched Malcolm X, Do the Right Thing, uh, Clockers, uh, Jungle Fever, Twenty Five Hour. Clockers is definitely another one we got to hit on this show at some point. Yo, yeah, Clock- Clockers is Clockers is an underrated movie. Yeah, I mean, it's shit that 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 movie predates The Wire and does like a lot of the stuff that that show gets you know credit for. I mean, it's a great yeah. show, but like you know, you can see Spike doing it like you know uh, seven years earlier. There's um, some issues with it for certain. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, every, I mean, almost almost every single Spike film, but like three of them are a little messy, right? Like, but, oh yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, part, I mean, it's, it, it's part of his uh, playfulness, I think, as a filmmaker. He's always, yeah. you know, he, he always wants to take something in a in a strange direction. And honestly, even if it doesn't work, a lot of the time it's more interesting than yeah. uh, people who don't take those kind of risks that he if takes. You were to, sure. If you were to ask me what are the perfect spec movies, I'd be like, do the right thing, 25th hour, Malcolm X. But other than that, like, there's no spec movies that are, like, perfect, right? There's Man, a spec 25th movie. 25th hour, what a movie. Yeah, it's so I mean. good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, we're, we're already we're already yeah. getting distracted here, but I think Malcolm X is a good jumping off point for Spike in general because he it's actually where he gets the title for the film from. Uh, from and and he uses a clip of it in the movie. Um, it, it, it's from one of the big speeches that Denzel has in Malcolm X. Right, we've been where, 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 let us straight. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. You've been had. You've been right. took. Been, been took. Hoodwinked. Hoodwinked. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, oh my god. Yeah. It's what a what a speech. It, it is. It, and I think. Um, uh, yeah. And and I think that fury that's in his other movies is in this movie as well. And that's what I think is very interesting. It took Spike Spike's whole career to make this movie. Definitely. Because, well, because, because it, 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 as I mentioned, it, it definitely stemmed from his frustrations as a black artist in the industry where he was like, you know, he was getting movies made, but he was having this hard thing where like even his successful movies, it wasn't leading to like the next thing that a successful movie should lead to where he gets the next bigger movie or anything like that. It, he always ran into a, these or any awards. Right. Or any awards. Yeah, he famously lost uh, Do the Right Thing. Uh, he didn't get nominated for anything except for screenplay. And then he lost to Driving Miss Daisy, <laughs> which he was not happy with. <laughs> and it reminds me again when he was nominated against Green Book for Black Klansman just a couple of years ago. I love that fucking oh, yeah. clip of him that goes around every so often where he's just like, not was my it, cup of tea. Cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he starts like dancing around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is a oh, perfect man. summation. Spike is awesome man Spike is <laughs> he's he, he he is and and his work in the 90s is so interesting because again you know he had the success of do the 
right thing. And he had, a, for some reason, he was like, I don't know how I can't channel this into getting a Malcolm X movie made easier than I am. And so that was where he got frustrated. And then that carried with him, you know, as he did, you know, he made a bunch of great movies that he, like Crooklyn, his uh, very personal family drama with Delroy Lindo that he did, and then Clockers which was, you know, about community relationships and sort of, like, low-level uh, dealing. And then um, his more, like, underrated ones, even, like, Girl 6, which is his kind Ooh. of absurdist look at, we'll, like, sex we'll, work. We'll talk about we'll talk about Girl 6 a little bit because I there's a theory I have that relates to... Well, not a, a theory that I had saw Matt Zola Seitz actually say, and, like, I've been thinking about it a little bit oh, okay. more... Okay, okay. About bamboozled, so we'll get to Girl Six as well. A cool. Little bit, maybe. Yeah, no, I I like Girl Six, and I think that it's kind of what it kind of went for with the whole phone sex thing. Definitely paved the way a little bit for what Boots Riley was doing, and sorry to bother you, and stuff like that. And but I mean, shit, he also made as Jason mentioned, he got game, an incredible like familial drama slash basketball movie, and one of the best basketball movies. And he also did a doc on the bombing of the black church in Alabama in the '60s for little girls. And I'm trying to think what else he did. He did interracial relationships and jung- jungle fever, uh, summer of Sam, which was like a movie that probably should have been made as like a Zodiac style serial killer movie, but he milks it for like as much sweat and sex and absurdity as you can to the point where it's just kind of weird. Uh, so Spike was in like a really weird mode in the nineties. And part of the issues that he had was that, you know, he was having troubles getting some of these movies made. And then when they were getting made too, he was getting kind of like these weird reviews and he kept getting painted as kind of like this, 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 uh, you know, he's the one black filmmaker who has the kind of spotlight that he has. And he's, he's here to yell at you about issues and he's here to be angry. And that was kind of the image that got painted of him all the time that he was always very frustrated with. Because if you watch any of those movies that I mentioned, they don't, really play that way um i mean we were kind of talking before we started but you were mentioning jason that like do the right thing has a, a lot of humanity and empathy for sal and his family in right. do the right thing you know it, 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 yeah. it's, it's not like spike getting on a soapbox and screaming at the white audience watching that film in, in a lot of ways <laughs> right. in a lot of ways in a lot of ways i think uh, spike for me has has historically i think been compared to public enemy right that type of like yeah, uh, I think he would be the people would call him right the Chuck D of filmmaking. Very, very abrasive. Very abrasive. Mm-hmm. Um, um, not subtle. Very, you know, hit you in the head with what he's saying. But I don't think that gives Spike enough credit for his talent. I don't think that's always true. It's true no. in Malcolm X, but it's not always true. It's not he like we talk about composed. that composed. Like he is very calculated yes. and composed, even though he is he's, very cal- yeah. and he's very nuanced. He's very nuanced, very calculated. He gives his characters a lot of humanity, and a lot of his best movies, a lot of his most famous movies, the characters have a lot of humanity. They have a lot of even when they're wrong, right? Even when they're wrong, they have a lot of uh, lived-in feeling to it, right? There's a lot right. of yeah. You can relate to John Turturro is absolutely racist and wrong and do the right thing, but you can. Re- you can kind of, you know him you know you know who that guy is you've seen that guy before right whereas yeah. in yeah and so I think I think that's it, Spec has not been given enough credit for the movie that we're going to talk about is one of those fury he, he's a little bit well yeah here. Th- yeah that's exactly and what I, I was yeah, building towards is that bam- because, bamboozled is yeah, that he, movie yeah. he gets accused of making every time exactly, he makes a which movie. Exactly, which is funny. And, and, and so, he was, <laughs> so it, it, it is his middle <laughs> finger movie where he yeah. was like, fine, I'm going to make the movie that you think I make. Yeah. And I'm going to make it as good as someone can. And man, uh, he does. I think that this is one of, if not his most formally uh, audacious movie with the with the blending, like the, the way that he approached it with like these kind of like crummy digital cameras that he could kind of find, but then also, yeah. again, like this very playful and very absurdist writing style. Like the characters are absolutely not the kind of humanist characters you might see in many of the films that he's made before. A lot of the dramas that he makes where he has so much empathy for all of his characters. This one is one where he has empathy for some of the characters, but some of them you can tell that he wants to reach into the screen and slap them around. <laughs> I don't even think, I, 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 you know, what's really funny is, and we'll get to the Rappaport character, but like, even, oh my god! <laughs> even but like even uh, Pierre, who's played by Damon Wayans, who's very good in this. Oh my god! He, it's, I think Pierre, it's my favorite performance I've seen of this man. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, even, so. yeah, 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 me too. Even Pierre is like immensely laughed at by Spike in this movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Immensely. Yeah, yeah. By everybody else, including including Rappaport, but even the other black people in the movie are laughing at Pierre. It's oh, yeah. Ver- it's, and, 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 and we talked about uh, self-representation and flipping things on its ass. And uh, when we talked about Rudy Ray Moore, Spike is doing that here, too, as well, when it comes to... Uh, fine, I'll make the move that you want to make. But he's also doing it when it comes to the idea of I am a presentable black man. Mm -hmm. And I think that Pierre, Pierre believes himself to be, Pierre is correct about his bosses. At the same time, and this is where, again, a very nuanced portrayal of somebody. At the same time, Pierre is incorrect about the fact that he can be a presentable black man in white America. He can't. Regardless of whether Pierre uh, dresses, oh man, that, that 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 sophisticated like cartoon voice that he puts on for the whole movie <laughs> yes, yeah. is yes, incredible, the whole, and, and, the and, and the fact movie. that he maintains it, and that it's yeah, like you know, yeah. like like at a certain point, like when you when I first watched this movie and I first heard that voice, I was like, "There's no way that that's his voice." for the, yeah, the whole I fucking felt, movie. I felt like that too. At first it was kind of jarring almost to me. I was like this, I get that it's satirical, but it felt almost too it's silly. Like a- but then as things started to expand and as this just got darker and darker, I was just like, oh, okay. Like this voice is and really- And as, uh, as you meet, as you, I think the scene with the dad is really important because as you meet oh the my dad, God, yeah. as you meet the dad, you realize, oh wait, not nah, Pierre just thinks that he's like, uh, 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 like Pierre just thinks that he's above other black people. That's like what's really what's going on, kind of. It's like Pierre mm-hmm. kind of thinks he's above other black people, right? It's like he is correct that the stuff that he pushes should be getting greenlit as much as uh, something that he would, you know, push that was, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, ghetto or ignorant. But at the same time, you get the feeling throughout the movie that Pierre thinks that he's above other black people. And that's why he's like, that's why he's just like, oh, no, why, why can't I get this and that done? And why can't blah, 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 blah. But what he doesn't understand is that white America does not care about class. Really, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Not, in, and not, not, in the corny, not in the corny identity politics sense, but in the idea that even if you, quote unquote, look presentable, white America is going to get you. If you're a black person, it doesn't matter if you're dressing. It doesn't matter if you dress like Little Wayne or you dress like Obama. White America is going to get you. like yeah. Well, and, and, and Pierre is definitely like that kind of like perfect a- example because of the way that he acts in front of everyone. Like he's he's trying he, his best to to do a performance of like a white network television executive. And exactly. Like, That's and who I always, work with. That's who I am. He, he always yeah, yeah he always feels the need to tell people he graduated from Harvard too. Yes. Yeah. yes. Like constantly. And it's like something where it's it's something where Pierre feels the need to Pierre feels that need to prove himself to white people and also to his fellow black people. It's like it's very it, it's it's a it's immensely interesting the portrayal that Spike has on Pierre because it's not Spike is not only angry at the white people in this movie, he also thinks that Pierre's kind of a clown. Yeah, and yeah. he has like yeah. this. He lives in this constant contradiction where, like, he he makes this show, in theory, so that that it, he he gets it canceled and that he proves that he doesn't want like America wouldn't want to see black people portrayed this way. But then at the same time, in order to do that, he exploits street performers and puts them on the television show to to do that actual act. So like, it, he's constantly contradicting himself through his actions, through his image, through. Through just th- through it, who he is as a person, and then what he does throughout the yeah, movie. Yeah, and, and 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 part of I think what Spike is going for is that Pierre is obviously he is uh, misguided in what he planned to do here. I think Sloane, yeah. the Jada Pinkett Smith character, is kind of right. like the voice of reason in this film. She's great Pierre, in this movie. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 I, I, I I love Jada Pinkett. I love Jada Pinkett. I think she's great in Collateral, and she's also really good in this movie. Not giving enough credit for it as well. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she's and, and, constantly at uh, on his ass, just like this is a fucking horrible <laughs> like decision. What are you doing here? She's like really yeah. the only one on screen in that meeting that's at the table, kind of going, "What the fuck what the are fuck? we even doing here?" <laughs> yeah, like yeah. what is this? So yeah, yeah and, and for anyone who character. hasn't seen the film, we we should maybe mention that like you know what Spike is kind of ultimately doing here is a really darkly funny uh rise and fall story of a sort Mm -hmm. of you know a complicit black artist who like 
the characters in, say, you know, other media satire or something like the producers. Uh, he tries to make the most racist, offensive show that he could possibly imagine with the idea that he will get his uh, white racist boss fired and, you know, and, and, and sort of e- expose right. him because his boss is played by Michael Rappaport in one of the uh, filthiest performances in the movie and very um, uh, disturbing and hilarious at the same time. But one the whole of the idea greatest is like- casting decisions, I think, <laughs> of all time. Yes. Up there, yeah. with, up there with Fincher casting Affleck like it, 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 <laughs> I can't I can't put into words how perfect that shit is because Michael yeah, yeah. Rappaport in real life like yo he low-key thinks that he's black and it's right. so it's, yeah. it's, yo I tweeted the other day yeah, I dude. tweeted the other day I was like yo I think I would choke this man if he tried to talk to me Michael Rappaport it's on site right now yeah. <laughs> yeah. Michael Rappaport don't talk to me bro <laughs> I hate the fact that this man is also a Knicks fan I like I <laughs> it's like it's like yo it is like what a what a perfect casting decision i and i, yeah. I think i think that um matt so matt zola cites I, I tweeted about uh bamboozle and matt zola cites uh replied to me and he says that he thinks that rap report is also supposed to be be spike making fun of quentin tarantino yeah, because okay. there was that no, there was that I, famous beef that they had in the in in the nineties, right? That I, was definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, he he literally puts that line in his mouth where he yeah. says, "What what 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 is what's the line that he gets?" Where he's just like, "Tarantino was right. Uh, it's it's just a word. Uh, right, I should be able right. to say it. I have a black yeah. wife or whatever." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think now, and now this is not. I and, and that beef, I'm in the middle. I think that both men have valid points. I love both men's movies. And Glorious Bastards is like mm-hmm. I, I will get that movie tattooed on me. So like I'm not, I'm <laughs> oh, not, yeah. I am not anti, I'm not anti Quentin. So don't don't get me don't get me wrong. But I think it's a very interesting. Um, I think that is a very interesting take and a very interesting a uh, a very interesting hypothesis on that character. But in general, mm-hmm. it's just a hell of a casting choice for Spike. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, he yeah. he literally Nailed he it. also casted Tarantino in Girl Six, no, right, as like right, the, the, yeah. the, the the creepy the creepy casting guy <laughs> yeah. who has his hands who's, like who's, all over like the black women. <laughs> right, exactly, oh <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, and I think when he's like, "Oh, Tarantino's right. I have a, I have a black wife. I can use it." And it's like, I think that's kind of like, I, I kind of, I'm seeing kind of when Matt, when MZS tweeted that at me, I was like, "Wait, actually, yo, that maybe, like, you know, what I mean, it's, it's very, it's a very interesting idea." So, yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 Definitely. the thing about Michael Rapport's character as his boss too is that he he, he speaks in, you know in a, a very cartoonish African-American vernacular uh, right. kind of way. And it's so funny watching him sit next to Damon Wayans, who is is being like, Bartholomew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like yo, I'm, like, yo, I'm a black man, right? So obviously, right? So like, yeah. but if you look at the way that I talk, it ain't, it ain't, it's not, you know, it's not like the way Michael Rapport's talking in that movie, right? It's like right. Michael Rapport's no, no, doing... No. Maca Rap Report is doing the racist version of like the of AAVE, right? He's doing the racist yeah, version yeah. of Ebonics. Yeah. And so it's it's just it's really jarring to see him and Pierre talk to one another because Pierre's being all like, oh, well, you know, I'm you know, let's 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 push uh Let's push a you know a, a good show uh, you know a, a, a good written show and Mac Rap was like yo man yo you know what we should get brother we should get uh the fucking Cosby show again yo <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, and, and, and it's it's so it's so baffling because like those performances are both so heightened and what's so yeah. sort of interesting is that the you know because because again like the performances are heightened and the style of writing is so heightened but the actual filmmaking again it's this very ugly looking sort of digital video look that he got on these really cheap cameras and it makes you know Pierre's apartment and office look even more like sterile than it would otherwise not on these definitely. cameras and. The shots also of like the street performers, like crummy apartment and stuff, look even more dilapidated. But also because the cameras were so cheap, he was able to basically shoot with like five or six at the same time. So he was basically like filming scenes very quickly because he could film them all from multiple angles. 
Is that why he did so a- many angles? Like, I remember there's one with Rappaport. It's the introduction scene, actually, and he's just in the, the conference room and just yelling at everybody. And, and Spike is constantly, like, pretty much every sentence that he says cuts to a different angle. And I was, I just, that... That yeah, yeah, head, he, he, so. he he definitely you know took advantage of the fact that he had so many cameras and could do that, but also mm-hmm. you know he he wanted kind of like this weird feel almost like sometimes because of the way that this the, the footage looks uh, in post, you feel like you're watching like security footage or like handheld camcorder home footage or something like that. And, yeah. and, and then but but then it'll get up. A- it makes working in the office look miserable as fuck too. Yeah, really <laughs> oh, yeah. uncomfortable, and and also Just it lifeless. has a surreal effect. Claustrophobic, like, really lifeless. Yeah. Like Pierre's mm-hmm. life looks very lifeless and like real claustrophobic, and I think that yeah. is a I, I, that's not by an accident. It's Spike being like, "Yo, this is white America, and it's it. This is white America, and this is white Hollywood, and this is the price you pay when you're like trying to work with these people." Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and and that that's just it. It has this eventually surreal effect because what you're watching, it feels sort of like in that same way that you know, um, you know, Michael Mann uses digital. It's something that feels uh, it has a very immediate quality to it, where you're very real, you're very in that moment at that moment in time. And then obviously Michael Mann will take that and then stylishly, you know, get some more expressive emotional qualities out of it. But that's not what Spike's going for. What Spike's going for is that you're watching something that you know, uh, I guess. On, on some level, it kind of looks just like real footage of a real office, but yeah. then the things that are that are taking place in that office are so absurd and filled with so much humor and like a surreal quality that it kind of takes on this unreal quality at the same time. So you're watching things that maybe should feel uh, unreal, like the level of racism that you see in this movie. <laughs> yeah. There are so many slurs. I learned slurs from this movie, I think. Yeah, it's actually um, kind of <laughs> crazy, though. It's like... Because Spike movies are full of racist characters, right? Yeah. I mean, we just we yeah. spoke about it. I mean, from from Do the Right Thing to Black Klansman, it's or like Twenty Fifth Hour giant his his monologue about just all the races and how it takes <laughs> all of them. Yes, <laughs> yo, but that monologue's a little bit different though, because that monologue True. is a that monologue is a white person like talking about like his environment in the city, right? Because like New yeah, York City's yeah. a New York, New York City's what. What I love about that movie in particular is that it portrays New York City as it being a melting pot, right? So like, Monty has a problem with every fucking body. Uh huh. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas, definitely. Whereas, right. Whereas in Bamboozled and other and in and in other Spike movies, it's just like direct. It's like do the right thing. Besides the besides the uh, grocery store owners who are Korean, do the right thing is Italian people versus black people. Mm-hmm. Like in in the height in the height of like Italian versus oh yeah Black Monty and Twenty Fifth Hour he wants to take everyone on and he part of what I love about that on. monologue in particular though is that there's also this quality to it where Ed Norton's character is kind of like reassuring himself that he is okay with leaving it behind because he hates New York so much yeah um, right. but it but it reminds me of that idea of like you know if you can talk about something in so much loving detail like the way he <laughs> does in that absurdly racist monologue where he he clearly has studied his community and in some ways yeah. you know he's he's screaming about it because he's going to miss it when he is you know stripped from it and taken to prison and stuff like that so there again he spike always finds a way to introduce Introduce a very you know human emotional aspect, even when a character like Edward Norton is literally just yelling slurs at the camera. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> what, what a scene! But it, 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 it's <laughs> it's it's a little bit different in, in Bamboozle because like, but like in Bamboozle, literally, I still think this is the most racist film ever he's ever done. Whereas, like, oh yeah, the yeah. character not not Spike himself, but the characters in Bamboozle right. are the most racist in any Spike movie. And like that's like saying something, but it's like they're like cartoonishly racist. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's absolutely is, the point. Again, the, yeah. the whole the whole thing is that Michael Rapaport he wants a black show. He wants something because the ratings are down, and so so it, it, it takes on a uh, you know again it, it kind of combines that idea of the producers where they're going to make something that's so absurd that it couldn't possibly be successful, um, and instead it turns out. You know that you know with, with with Spike Lee merging it with that kind of impassioned anger and darkness of the media satire or something like Network, he he takes it to that that level where like, what if this show actually was uh, successful? 
right. uh, as 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 a big kind of like twist that kind of takes place, you know, which, more closer to like the middle. Which of the again, movie. which again is a direct provocation of white America and the stuff that they like, right? Yeah, that, saying, yeah like, that they would that, that they would eat the show up, yeah, that they would give like, it good actually, reviews. It's like, actually, you would f- <laughs> actually you would like this show. It's like, actually, you guys would like this shit because like this is this would I think what we talked about before, right? It's like this show would uh, fit in your mindset of what black art should be or what black people should be. Yeah. Well, and, and man, the, the shit that they come up with for that show, because oh we, 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 it, it is some like, it is intentionally, you know, he, he is using sort of like a, a history of, of Hollywood blackface that does exist. Um, oh, he, yeah. he, he at the, he at the end of the movie ends on actually on a very, um, very quiet montage, actually. Like, after so much of this movie has been so heightened, it's so amazing getting to the end of the movie where he just does one clip after another of all of the diff- various blackface that has been done throughout the history of Hollywood. Do you, um, do y'all think that that is the best? Because he's done all those montages throughout his career, right? That's right, one that of his like best, historical, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that's the best one that he's done? I think it is. I think, it, out I, of what I've seen, and I haven't seen a lot of Spike Lee mm-hmm. yet, but out of the the four or five that i've seen it's my favorite one like it's, yeah. it's i the definitely one I like the, the most impact i like the 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 trickery of the burning american flag uh versus um who is it that appears at the end of malcolm x i remember the way that the uh, malcolm x opening and closing being very audacious in a similar kind of way but it, it oh, is yeah. also not as um as, as elongated out as this one is because i think after two after you've spent like two hours in what this film is, which is again, it's this, this very sort of this movie that's been stripped of the kind of style and musicality and color and life that Spike Lee usually has in his kind of dramas that he makes. He's very well known for, you know, you know, even, you know, something like Crooklyn, which just looks beautiful. Or what's that, uh, what's that musician one he did with Denzel? Mo, Mo Better Blues? Like, ooh, like there's ooh. there's something sensual and colorful about the films that he makes, and this one is is very blunt. It's very muddy with the way that it looks. Yeah. It, it almost reminded me of the digital video of like David Lynch's Inland Empire, which is that is like obviously applied more as like horror and surreal quality. But when you when you see those images of like the performers getting ready backstage and these you know these black performers putting on additional blackface and the the fire and they truck do the red step by lipstick. Step on how to and make the, the black face uh oh my like god the yeah or whatever it is like it's, and, and, yeah. and them in that black void dressing room and then hard cut to the again the we haven't mentioned it but but, but like put on. yeah the, the racist show that they make is literally an updated minstrel show yeah and yeah. when it cuts to the minstrel show he switches and uh i think credit um not just to him but also to one of his regular cinematographers ellen curis um, who I think also shot Son of Sam and He Got Game as well. I think that's the other ones that she shot for him. Ooh, uh, sw- he sw- Got Game has beautiful cinematography. Yeah, and but that choice to switch from that digital video to that like that sixteen millimeter that just absolutely pops. Like it obviously it mirrors the yeah. a similar formal switch he did in his um, debut. She's got to have it, where it it goes from black and white mm-hmm. to color. Uh, but this goes to color during the minstrel show, and it's a very genius idea. It's a very icky idea where that now that you're watching the most racist shit you've ever fucking seen, those images pop off the screen. They sing. Yeah. They catch your eye. Spike cannot have you looking away. <laughs> uh, and the during... performances by the two oh my God, street performers yeah. are like just because because they just they go for it. You know, they're doing all the over the top uh, gestures and mannerisms and. And it's just such a committed performance that it's like I just have so much, you know, respect for it. Uh, in you a way. could only get and what it, what's also interesting about that is it's a performance within a performance. Right. So, yeah, yeah. In in the movie, you could only get that type of like hardcore performance by people who didn't expect to ever have money like in their lives. Right. Like these are like right. poor street street people. Yep. Yeah, he, he, he literally sees them doing street performances outside his corporate office, which is how he thinks of them. Because there's yeah. there's the one guy, Man Ray, and then there's the other guy, Womack. And he decides that these two guys should be the leads of his show because no name actor would ever agree to be in the and kind of show. Yeah. 
forget no name actor like no like regular black person would ever do something like this yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's like you know what i mean and so it, it's like it's like i have to pick people who are like desperate yeah there's for even money. a yes. scene where they say like <laughs> and, we need money now and they're like okay we'll give you 10 grand like as an advance so it's it's automatically just something that it's like you know they take it because that it's their only option at, at that point um and they well just yeah he, 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 he offers to buy them like toothpaste and deodorant and yeah. shit and because he's like that, they can't even afford it the street performers say uh like you got you won't even give us the time of day and the only time that he does is when he can exploit them with this show so yeah it's pretty uh pretty gross and man that 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 show again he pitches it to his boss as like a modern variety show where he's going to take this american form of tv he's going to repurpose it as man tan the new millennium minstrel show very cool too also that this movie came out at the top of a new millennium as well Mm -hmm. yeah um but it's the trial he says it's the trials and tribulations of man tan and sleep and eat to ignorant, dull-witted, lazy, and unlucky uh, black men who basically hold every stereotype that you could possibly imagine, uh, both in the history of America and in the history of of entertainment. And they um, and they even use like classic comedy routines. Like there's one that they do, but like you know the classic comedy routine where it's like who is at first, what is at second. That yeah, whole thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that, but they do it with this really gross, like incestual uh, relationship where they say, like, I'm my own great uncle or something like that because they fucked their right, grandma yeah. or something like that. And it's interesting to see that too, where they use these classic comedy bits, but then flip them on their head to make them these really gross, even more you know, racist. Somehow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah crazy. Exactly. Even like immensely racist, like comedy. Yeah. Well, oh my god, when, 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 when he's when he's in the the pitch meeting and the, the the two street performers and Jada Pinkett Smith, who you know haven't heard the the exact pitch yet, they have their jaws like on the floor watching Pierre talk with Michael Rappaport. And yeah, he's like, yeah, I want Aunt Jemima in a do rag on a plantation. Like that's yeah. the kind of shit that he's talking about. They, I mean, th- th- this is a movie that yeah. that casts uh, the roots as a band that performs in the show called the Alabama porch monkeys. And they play the, the show takes place in a watermelon patch. And like, honestly, it's like the the most racist thing you could possibly conceive of. By the way, this is the root. This is the roots. We're talking about the roots is alternative hip hop. We're not talking about no limit records here. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, 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 it's really interesting. The uh, extent, that it goes kind of right. Like the racism in this movie doesn't really have a lot of nuance to it. It's just like, we're throw it's it just all. Like, it's it's like take, every vaguely racist thing throw. you've ever heard. Let's just throw it all at the wall. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and it makes yeah. sense. And, and, and it, it makes sense wall. for yeah. Pierre because Pierre is sitting here trying to literally conceive of the most racist thing right. he intellectually could come up with as in his mind as a bit <laughs> and and, and, right. and michael rapaport i lo- got his reaction in that pitch meeting where he's just like yeah raw dog man keep it real bust a move <laughs> the, like this is the shit that he's <laughs> <Yeah>. saying <laughs> bust a move yeah yeah man i love that <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> yeah but 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 what ends up happening is that um, pierre you know he 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 gets this show off the ground he 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 gets this show and it ends up being a really really big success for him to the point where you know he fucking at later on in the movie he fucking wins an emmy for it he sees more success than he's ever had and in some ways you know he he sits on in those pitch meetings too where they're like okay the show is obviously going to have backlash uh, we understand that. And I love that bit where they sit him down and they're just like, okay, well, you see, but it can't be racist because your name is on it as a showrunner and you're a black man. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, and I love that meeting where they walk him through like all of the various different things that he needs to say to like, kind of like get ahead of this and, and, and all of that. Um, but it ends up coming um, to a fold a little bit where Sloane's brother is part of like kind of like this independent hip hop group that's very sort of politically activated. Played by played by Yasin Bey. Played right. by Mo Steph. Yasin oh, Bey. Yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. I, yeah, he's great in it. Yeah, he's really yeah well good. and 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 he's he's the leader of a group called the the Mau Mau's. And I love that bit when they they try to audition for his show and they're you know they're they're doing like this very sort of politically active hip hop 
song for him, and Pierre is just more uncomfortable than right. you've ever seen him yeah. listening to like just these black men like describe their experiences to him in song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pierre, I think Pierre, I think I, th- I legitimately think like Pierre probably would not be into hip hop, right? Oh, like, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Pierre's just like Pierre's just like give me Stevie Wonder. And Pierre's <laughs> like he's just like he's like nah. He's like black men rapping. Nah, I don't want to hear yeah. this. Like, I don't Pierre's think he's a fan like, of Wu Tang yeah. at all. No. No, 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 Pierre, Pierre, I have a Wu-Tang tattoo, so, like, Pierre definitely would not have a Wu-Tang tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, uh, and so, you know, then Boozle also has an interesting relationship with hip-hop, right? Because at one scene, Pierre, I forgot what he exactly says, but he says something to the level of, you know, you know, hip-hop has a lot of gangster rap. Like, why, why do they have that, right? Mm-hmm. And... I, I, I still now so like what's interesting about that is that is something that Spike has actually said like in like real life and has kind of like pushed in real life. No, I don't know whether Spike is making fun of Pierre here or if Spike actually genuinely does believe that. But me personally, the music of Public Enemy or the music of NWA or the music of Most Def or, or Tyler Coley or any like socially quote unquote socially aware mm-hmm. rapper means just as much to me as the music of No Limit does or the music of, like, Cash Money or any, like, or any contemporary regular money money or money and, 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 and bitches type of rap. You <laughs> right. know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. to me... Because to me, it's just an art form, and both things are have to do with the art form. Both things are, are topics that the art form talks about, yeah. right? And so the... I And so it, it's another thing that has, has to do with how Pierre sees himself, mm-hmm. It's like Pierre kind of sees himself as like above all that other shit, and that's why he kind of like starts this. Move oh yeah, I mean that that, to, that line that he has when he is listening to that performance is he says, "I don't want to do with, I don't want have want to have anything to do with anything black for at least a week." That is his response yeah, to yeah. them auditioning to be the band <laughs> on the show. Great, great line, great, great line reading, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but but yeah, he so he th- there's kind of like this this push and pull with Pierre where he he knows that he's obviously staging something incredibly racist, um, and in- intentionally so. But then it, it kind of like work works out for him, and he kind of you know he feels you know I wouldn't say aligned with Michael Rapaport, but he he kind of goes man on on some level you know he he predicted what it was that the people wanted, <laughs> and 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 I mean I, right, I love right, that right, bit right. where Michael Rapaport is uh, telling him where he's like I know your pe- people better than you do look at all the brothers on the wall and there's all like the basketball players like yeah. behind him <laughs> like portraits of them on his wall Yo, and shit it's like that only, it's only hoopers too it's only like athletes and shit it's yeah, yeah like, it's like Mike Tyson and Jordan and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really yeah. Funny. I mean, I'm, I'm, well, it, it's funny. It, it's it's it, it mirrors you know like do the right thing when they have that conversation in in Sal's restaurant That's where they right. ask they That's ask right. like yeah. how come there's no there's no you know black celebrities or, on the wall or what I was thinking what I was what seeing and do the right thing that I was thinking was when Mookie tells uh, John Turturro's character who I think is Pino or is Pino the younger brother Wh- whatever he he tells John Turturro's character he's like what are you talking about. You like more black. You like more black celebrities than I do. You love Eddie. You love Prince. You love Magic Johnson. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and Johnson and Johnson Turtle's like, well, you know, Prince and Eddie and Magic. Those guys, you know, they're black, but they're not really black. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like, and, and it's kind of the idea of that transcending race, right? It's the mm-hmm. idea of like. Yeah. You, it's the idea that you can transcend race, which is not really true, but it's the idea that it's like white people will let you lead you believe that you can actually do that mm-hmm. while still being racist themselves. It's a very interesting push and pill. And so um, I, I think I think that's where that comes from when it comes to uh, Michael Rappaport having that against his wall. It's really funny. He's like, I, I, I love the brothers. And it's just like only athletes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and then really and then. Great. He brings in that Scandinavian guy to also punch up the script, the script with more racism, right? Because it felt because because he felt like it didn't have enough, and Pierre was looking at it and being like, "Okay, this is even more racist than 
I thought I was being when I was trying to be racist and they include stuff about like crack babies and like welfare into the show. Yeah. Um, shit. They call, they call the watermelons in that like N word apples and shit. Like it's like, like it, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's absolutely <laughs> absurd. Like the shit that goes on on that show yeah. and, and watching at first the audience is kind of like the, the audience who is watching the, the, the taping of the pilot is kind of like unsure how to react to it. They're kind of like, yeah, I, is is it is this allowed? Am I? Is it okay that if I laugh yeah, at this like, and then like, it's allowed? They're, like, yeah. they're looking back and forth. Like, should I be laughing? Like, I don't know. <laughs> right. And then, yeah, I mean, and, then and, and, and what's funny is that by the end, man, that audience is like in blackface, being like, right. <laughs> we're black. I was just, and they they also yeah. merchandise it. They have like kids oh, wearing man. the blackface mask and like the white gloves and. And yeah. and it's fucking wild. And then you start getting like it's those commercialized. It's yeah, commercialized. Exactly, yeah, dude. There, there, exactly. There's giant billboards in New York. <laughs> there's like bus ads <laughs> with the fucking images on it. It's it's that classic uh, that sowing and reaping tweet. <laughs> yeah, for, it, for for Pierre. <laughs> and what's the t- what is the take of having um, like black people in the audience in the blackface? Is that similar to like what? Pierre is kind of going through a little different, but like an internal struggle there where they. Well, oh, you're, you're, you're talking about the girl who appears at well, the last show. I'm just, well, just, uh, well, maybe there's like something specific, but as the audience grows, as the show goes on, uh, it shows like all races basically in blackface and in the white gloves and stuff. And so I was just wondering what the interpretation mm. would be of like, it'd be, you know, a, a different way of viewing it for a black person, I'm sure than a white person. So yeah, because there, there there is a there is a black girl at the end because they're 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 having everyone in like in the last show, you know, like the the, the one guy gets up and he's like an Italian man in blackface and he's right. like I'm the blackest because I'm Italian <laughs> and he starts rapping <laughs> or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's that's and, like and the, that, yeah, yeah. That's that, like the that epicenter of crazy. Spike in general. Just like that's like the epicenter of Spike in general. Like Italians like being like, yeah, I'm black too. It's like <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and, and well yeah but then there there also is there there is like a young black girl who shows up also in blackface as part of the audience being like i love the show too and and right. i for me i think that's part of what we were talking about in um uh, about pd wheatstra that there's this idea that there is some sort of you know uh th- there can be in things like black exploitation when you take these stereotypes and you pump them up to an absurd degree there is a, a semblance of feeling like you can reclaim something right there is a right. feeling of something like and and i think that that was spike kind of uh acknowledging like that portion of the They're audience but i that. think okay. but i think that placing her in an audience of what is 90% white people doing blackface around her is part of what we were talking about on that where it's just like there is always you know going to be a biting audience who is just there because like racism is back baby it's better than ever <laughs> right yeah <laughs> it's yeah. cool again <laughs> it's popular yeah. it's a yeah. great time yeah. um and yeah and 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 it is it it's so i mean shit like spike really takes it as far as he could possibly take it and you you think about all the different you know because he completely just shows you episodes of the show practically filmed again in that really like luscious looking 16 millimeter where the colors are popping off the screen and then cut to you know them putting their outfits on backstage and like just filled with so much sorrow about what they're doing and one of the darkest shots is like every time that they look in the mirror really just kind of saddened by what they're doing but then right before they go on stage they put on the big fake smile and then it like fades into the stage performance a lot of the time yeah where where, where they jump through that giant like uh cartoon like uh like face they jump through like the mouth of it to like enter the show and stuff yeah and then later we Mm -hmm. have that that moment where um uh one of the one of the performers comes on stage without any of the makeup or whatever and and Pierre, for like, because, you know, everyone starts to panic or whatever, uh, takes him back and looks at the audience and goes like, don't worry, we're going to whip it out of him as a joke. Like, a, as yes. like a, a thing yeah. like, oh, we're just playfully yeah. like, like, you know, it, it's just it's such a wild thing to see over and over again. Just these these different ways of uh, internalizing racism and, and then exploring it. It's it's this is one of the craziest Warning, films yeah. I've ever <laughs> watched, honestly. Well, and, and, and I think Jason mentioned it before and we haven't we haven't talked about it yet, but that scene too where Pierre is also – because, you know, despite the fact that I think Spike 
thinks Pierre is like an absolute dork. Oh, yeah. um, he, he even does eventually feel some sympathy for his fall because he understands some of the, you know, the, the idea of making compromises and choices, you know, navigating a, a very white industry as a black artist. And you, you, you get the idea that Spike has probably been, you know, had bosses or talked to execs like Michael Rappaport in his life before. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this, there is or some just sympathy like, why for... Aren't you, why aren't you giving me portrayals of black people that, like, I can laugh at, right? Like, it's like, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's, a, it's, right. it's, it's like, it, I mean, at one point, I, I, I mean, Pierre is trying to push, like, positive, intelligent things about black people. And, like, rap reports, like, yeah, we don't want that Cosby shit. Like, we want, like... <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like we want, like, ignorance. And so, like, it, it's... I think... It, I, and, like you said, like, it, it feels like, you know, it's not one of Spike's more personal movies on the surface because, like, you know, it's not Brooklyn or yeah. Do the Right Thing. It's not something that's, like, lived in in that type of way. But it does feel like something that is Spike's uh, mindset kind of is mm-hmm. personal in this movie, right? Like, yeah, his yeah. feeling of rage is very personal when it comes to this movie. And so, it's yeah, it's you, you would imagine that he's dealt with that type of... I mean, it's like we talked about, like, this is... This movie can only exist because of what Spike went through in the '90s in Hollywood, right? Yeah, yeah well, so and and, 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 I, and yeah. I was thinking, like, I was kind of leading towards that bit that I find genuinely sad for Pierre, which is that bit where he goes and talks to his dad, and his dad is mm, yeah. almost—I mean, he's not—he's not a Rudy Ray Moore, but you assume that on some level, you know, he is a stand-up comedian who has retained you know, his sense of identity and dignity as while also still being an artist and by just, you know, doing very small sort of black venues where he does very specific comedy for, you know, his own people. And he incorporates that into his right. act and he talks about racism in his act and his experiences. And there, th- there's a very interesting conversation where that he has with his dad where he, you know, he, he's going to his dad and being like, okay, I'm successful and I'm having the kind of success that like my dad never had. And he kind of wants his dad to like tell him good job, son, or like, right. you know, you, you, yeah. you. And his dad is pretty much just like, nah, bro, like, your shit is Any questions is dude, and everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah, th- th- that bit where he goes, yeah, where yeah. the fuck did you get that accent? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. is, 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 is really kind of heartbreaking because you realize that, you know, like, in order to achieve the kind of huge success where you get a lot of money and you get the Emmy and you get the acclaim and you're not just, a, you know, an artist playing for, you know, uh, a comedy club of 30 people, you know, what he had to compromise and sacrifice about, you know, his own identity to do that yeah. uh, speaking, in that moment. It's really powerful. And speaking on that, too, they have that that uh, that segment where I think it's inside his head where he, like, wins a couple of uh, awards and he goes on the stage and he starts doing the minstrel show dances as like a like he's like actually excited. So he's unironically doing like some of the moves on the stage while he's receiving the award. Um, and it's, <laughs> yes. it's such but, a, it's such an image to, to see. But I think that the difference is, and it's really funny. That's really, it is really such an image to see, but I think that the difference is, and what Spike is trying to say is, I think the difference is there's a difference between doing stuff within your community mm-hmm. and doing stuff for white audiences and white. Right. Men. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. hundred yeah. percent. And, 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 and the lore of white money and the lore of quote unquote accessibility and, and um, transcending things and making it commercial is something that at first seems like something that you should do, but beware of the consequences that come yeah, with that. It's the deal and with so, the devil still in it, its own yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And in, in yeah. order to achieve a show that uh, Bill Clinton would watch and like. That was such a good <laughs> joke. Oh my God. I like this. <laughs> I like this. I like this. <laughs> so fucking yeah, me, 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 Meanwhile, what we just saw was him watching a commercial for uh, a, a very racist version of Tommy Hilfiger. You yes. can probably imagine the play on words that, that, yeah. that Spike threw in there, but like that's such like a crazy <laughs> little like racist spoof thing that he does. And that's what Bill Clinton is watching on television. <laughs> so, dude, that... I think that might be my favorite joke because it's only two seconds. It's so subtle and it's just Bill Clinton going, oh, I like this. It's so it's fucking hilarious. Oh, man. Yeah, it's good. It's good. 
<laughs> Such a good joke. Yeah, yeah but oh, then, man, but then, yeah, but then, eventually, Pierre, you know, in order to defend what he's done, because you know, people do genuinely get upset, and a lot of you know, uh, Sloane's brother and the Mau Mau's, who are a very politically active group, they take up like a a lot of offense to this because they are obviously trying to do art in a way that you know isn't sacrificing you know uh, who they are in order to do it and you know they're they're living small and they're living poor and they're you know they're they're chilling uh you know with the entire crew they're just making songs and they are you know they're going to auditions and stuff like they auditioned for his show at one point and so you know seeing this guy who they think has absolutely just betrayed everything that they believe in get all of this you know power and success from this white industry and he goes on that like that defense tour where he's talking about you know sort of the, the, the censors and everyone who is critiquing his show has a slave mentality is what he says i think on the radio show right um, yeah <laughs> And oh my god! And and Al Al Sharpton shows up picketing the, <laughs> yep. the fucking uh, the, the fucking how, network. I love how Sharpton and uh, and Sharpton's also a Malcolm X, by the way. And yeah, I love that. I love that. Uh, this is pre loose lost weight Sharpton. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's it, yeah. It, 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 it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, big man Sharpton, right. which is you know, yeah. Round I think that's the. I, Round Sharpton, yeah, I think that's the funniest part. Because <laughs> you see him and you're like, oh, wait, that's Al. Yeah, that's Reverend. That's the Reverend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's really Yeah, funny. and, and, and it, it's just so interesting watching Pierre, who knows what he's doing is wrong. He, he's he's talking to, you know, he, he sees that, you know, everyone he talks to who is not a racist white person at his job is, like, very uncomfortable with, you know, what the show is doing and the success of the show. I mean, Sloan eventually, you know, um, you know, she she's very unhappy with the direction that it's taken, but, you know, she still is kind of, um, uh, she kind of is, is happy for his it. success a little bit. Yeah. And I, I mean, there's a part where she's celebrating the success of the show with him and she gives him, you know, the minstrel piggy bank, um, which has, you know, sort of like the, the blackface uh, character like eating a coin that you throw into its uh, throw into its mouth, and she gives it to him as a gift to remind him of a time in this country when you and me were considered subhuman and inferior. And he's looking at mm-hmm. it, and it's like the exact same image that he has like on the show. Oh um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and then and then it's the same image that the audience eventually shows up for like the third taping that they're doing, all looking exactly like this little sort of doll that she's given him. And then she he starts having it all around his his room. He starts having all of these different sort of pieces of of images and memorabilia. These like recurring racist images that just literally start invading his his office and his headspace. Eventually, he That's dreams of himself segment. in it. <laughs> Yeah, which is just like like crazy stuff. And either way, eventually, the big thing that takes place in this film is that the Mau Mau's kidnap uh, Man Ray Manny, uh, who is obviously one of the street performers. He's the main street performer because actually Womack, he Womack I think is the most dignified (laughs) character other than Sloane, because Womack realizes uh, before they even do I think the second or third taping of the show Mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, and, uh, he leaves, he just leaves halfway through the movie and he doesn't come back. And, uh, he actually criticizes Manny for, you know, he's starting to talk like one of the white bosses about the, you know, them, all the kids messing, all the young black kids, like messing up the choreography and stuff like that. And a great Um, scene too, like that part where the, like he goes, the camera goes behind him and he turns around and then does that like facial change where he turns into his minstrel character to kind of show, uh, the other performer that it's like, like, this is what you're doing now. Like, do, don't you realize right. that like, this is what the persona that you've taken on. Um, oh yeah. And, and, and really that line that he gets dramatic scene, that line that he gets where he's like, you didn't talk that way when you were hungry. Like, do you mm-hmm. remember? Yeah. Me? Do you remember who yeah. I am? Like it, it may be a new millennium, but this is just all the same bullshit done over again. Yeah. Um, right. And 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 he does that bit where he goes into character, but without the makeup on, which is like a really right. surreal moment. And he goes, "Anything to make you laugh, master," and saying shit like that. It's it's really dark yeah. moment. And Manny, 
you know, it, it does eventually lead Manny into a little bit of existential crisis where he and Pierre and Sloane kind of have a bit of a falling out, a little bit of a romantic triangle going on there too, that they eventually end up all kind of having a falling out. And Manny wants to quit the show. But before he can quit the show, he's the face of the show. The Mau Mau's fucking kidnap him. And essentially, a really great use of the digital video, too. They they yeah. do a live broadcast snuff film, essentially, where they are going to make a statement about, you know, what this network is is doing with this show. And they, you know, make him do his little puppet, you know, monkey dancing routine that he does. And they are, like, shooting at his feet, like a literal fucking, like, Looney Tunes bit. Yeah. But it's shot in like this really crummy digital video that makes it look real. It reminds me of that bit in uh, Miami vice when those dudes get shredded by the sniper rifle fire. But like, oh, imagine yeah. a dude, imagine a bunch of, you know, rappers shooting at a dude uh, dancing at his feet, like an old Western or something like that. Like that's it's again, in, like, it's, it's that, really, that sense like, of realism versus absurdity in the and imagery. It's, yeah. And it's lit in this really like dark warehouse kind of thing. And he's on a wooden panel and it's just, it's got this mm-hmm. real, uh, like it's kind of like, it's, it's almost like a horror movie and just the way it's filmed in that, in that way, it looks very, uh, uh, nightmarish. Yeah. It's very dark in there. It's in, in, in uh, you know, where they kidnap him at too. And it's like, it's like, Oh yeah, yeah you want to do this? We'll perform for us now. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, very, yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah. It's, and, it's, and they, and they film life, them basically. literally yeah. shooting, shooting him graphically. Yeah. Like they, they, they just lot. gun him. Yeah. Down. They, they start shooting at his yeah. legs first and then I, they just shoot him straight in the chest and he's bleeding Josh, out on I, the ground. I, Josh, I remember when we were first talking about doing bamboozled, we had mentioned other media satires, right? And that's, mm-hmm. this is the part where I kind of thought at first, like the media satires that I was thinking was the producers and network, because like it also in network, what happens kind of is you have uh, a company that realizes that they might've went a little bit too far with this. And now they have to like, they have to like, you know, spoiler word, sorry, but it came out at 75 like they have to like assassinate this person. Right. And mm-hmm. so like, that's what you kind of see in bamboozled where it's like, yo, this shit like actually went to a place where like, now we have to take matters into our own hands. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. and, and a different ta- in a different way than in the network, but like still it's like that type of like media satire of be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. and, and that's just it too, is, is you're watching, the Mau Mau's shoot Manny and all you can feel is pain. Cause you know that Manny is not the person who did this. You right. know, Manny yeah. was just, yeah. he was, he was like them. He was a poor artist living on the street, just like them. And he, through the power of the money and the show, he became like a symbol of, of, of racist hate to them. And they felt something cathartic by gunning him down. I think, I, I mean, I think most deaf says, uh, I want to mark this, guy like Clint Eastwood style I think is, yeah. is, 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 is what he says and then and then they do that and the image again of you know the sort of camcorder footage of him doing that dance followed by what you know this really bloody shooting that basically just looks like snuff footage in comparison to to the previous dancing that we saw on the show is is really really grim too but not only that as a result the cops show up at the Mau Mau's uh, place and they shoot all of them down, just straight up, except for yeah. the one white guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. And he's like, and he's like, no, kill yeah. me. I'm black. Like, kill me too. <laughs> like, yeah, the M&M, like, <laughs> yeah, the M&M of, uh, of, <laughs> of the crew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and what's so sad about that, that moment is like this trajectory of what this show has done is that it basically just got all of the poor black people killed. Like the only victims at the end of this movie are all of the, you know, desperate starving black artists. Those yeah. are the only people who end up, you know, in any sort of, you know, uh, end up facing any sort of consequences. I guess Pierre does what though. Take- uh, Pierre does too, but Pierre's is a very personal consequences versus sure. the more yeah. uh, societal ones yeah. that I think uh, Manny and the the Mau Maus end up facing. For sure. Because um, yeah, the Mau Maus they just went crazy 
uh, on a guy that they shouldn't have. And then, you know, the police handle the rest from there. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the end of the movie is Pierre watching that happen on TV. He watches what, you know, his ideas have, you know, wrought in the real world. Yeah. And um, he, he Sloan, I think, ex, uh, comes to his office and shoots him because she, you know, Manny, she was romantically involved with and her brother was the leader of the Mau Mau's. Like she literally yeah, just watched the definitely. two closest people in her life get killed because of this show. And she obviously knows that Pierre was behind it. She shoots Pierre and Damon Wayne's getting that line where he quotes James Baldwin and he's like, people pay for what they do and still more for what they have allowed themselves to become and they pay with the lives that they lead. And he, he comes to that realization yeah. of like, you know, on some levels I deserve this or I understand why this happened to me and that shit was fucking crazy. So him bleeding out on the ground then leading into, you know, that um, montage of, yeah. you know, that traces the history of blackface and racism and, and the, and the myths of it. It's interesting that he was watching those on TV as he's dying, yes. too, and then it kind of as yeah. fades dying, into it. Yeah. yeah, it's a great Yeah, so, so it's, instead of seeing his life flash before his eyes, he's just watching, like, the history a of, of racism in history. Hollywood. Of yeah. racism, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's it, crazy. It, fades in, it fades into clips that literally are part, are ubiquitous in American culture. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it traces, you know, blackface and racism in Hollywood from Birth of a Nation to, like, little old Judy Garland putting on blackface, which yeah. is a thing that happened. To, um, yeah, I mean, to Bojangles tap dancing with, like, yeah, Shirley tunes. Temple, like, yep. cartoons. Like, um, there's even, I, I, I believe there's even a, a scene, I, for, I forgot whose actress was, unfortunately, but the... Uh, it, it's a cleaning lady, like a black cleaning lady, like cleaning for like white people, and like she's like, do, like you know, yeah, like she's the, she's, like, she, she's doing that uh, that mammy thing that they yeah they do yeah that mammy yeah. thing yeah the, like a jive turkey type, of, you know what I mean? Like yeah, it's like, exactly. It, it is it's jarring to see that it, it goes all the way to you know what I mean? It, like it goes even cartoons where. Uh, it's like Daffy Duck looks mad black and has like big lips. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it, it's stuff that you could imagine was innocuous to people and they didn't even know what they were even doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, what's so crazy. I think about the montage because it, 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 it obviously yeah. it's establishing how prevalent these images and ideas were throughout the history of, of America and of, of, of American film. But at the same time, it's also done in a way that is so different in tone from the rest of the movie, which, as we've mentioned, is very kind of like assaultive and, and kind of angry and heightened in a, in a way where Spike was leaning into what people, you know, were constantly, you know, uh, mistaking him as in, in his art. And this, there's a very simple Terrence Blanchard score, very beautiful, very mm -hmm. uh, like low key melody. And it's not like this montage is fast. It's not like, a, no. you know, a blurring of it. It just one after the other. Very simply, he's just like, here is all of these images and there's going to be no other sounds. It's not going to be abrasive. He just lets you sit there and look at them and think about and I, them. And yeah. that's it. And I think there's something to be said <laughs> yeah. about just like how much there is, because this is a like it, 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 first. It's just it's a, a, it's a long it's montage. A, oh, yeah. It's a final montage sequence. But then even once it ends and the credits go. He continues that montage with more. He turns. It, he goes and focuses more on like the merchandise of blackface in the credits. Mm -hmm. But it's just amazing to me just how much there was. You know, like there's just so much footage and so much merchandise that he was able to find to create this insanely big uh, montage. Yeah. It's just it says something. You know, it's. Uh, it really does. Yeah. yeah, it really does. I mean, there's all types of stuff in the Montauk. Real life stuff, cartoons. It's yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, then, and then it just ends on a simple thing where Pierre quotes his father and what his father said to him earlier. Uh, you know, that, that as, as a black man, you are inherently an entertainer to people. In, in some way like people are are watching you in that kind of way they have their eyes on you yeah. and he there's said a, so your only option man, like, is to keep them laughing yeah 
Yeah, yeah. There's and a man he, like eating chicken too. He's eating fried chicken. Like it's it's like yeah. it, it's car, it's all cartoonish and it, it, it's 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 jarring just how much that is ingrained, unfortunately, in American culture. Just like that type of like racism in art and the type of racism too that isn't on isn't like something like personal it's the type of racism that is just structural and the type of racism that is just ingrained in the shit it's the birth of it right the birth of a, of a nation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I, says all you need to know the the birth of a nation right it's yeah. like that is actually just ingrained in the country that we live in yeah and i i, I so love it, too it's, that it's, that you yeah. know he shows you that montage and he says always keep them laughing and just that it almost it almost has like a horror movie ending yes. with pierre's <laughs> like maniacal laughter playing over man ray in blackface in close-up because smile. yeah because because he he ends the montage with his own movie and he says i traced the history of blackface from birth of a nation the beginnings of film in american film and I traced it all the way to this movie you're watching right now in the year 2000. And, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unreal. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe pivoting, um, towards the reductive rating round. This one gets the high four from me, but honestly I keep, I, this is my second time watching it. I feel like with even more watches, this might even this, this, I feel like rises in my spike estimation, uh, ranking of him almost every it time has, that I've watched it. it. It's becomes top five spike for me. I think it's become five on my spike list. I, I it's just the fury involved in it. Mm hmm is just so it's to the point where you're like damn spike like after you <laughs> yeah. watch bamboozled you need to take like a walk <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you, I, I, again yeah, I, like, I think I, I think it's one of his most formally like accomplished and uh ingenious films that he's attempted it's also one of his most plainly you know like scathing and and assaultive of its audience uh the way that he takes like a like you know something that is very dark and perversely funny and walks that line of making it you know um practically a horror film sometimes and that you know again he's he all based on this idea of the way that america's historical racism has maintained itself in not just the the images that they do, but also in in uh, entertainment and in the entertainment industry, and how you know all those three things are sort of connected to each other. And then also again, he takes it to another level and makes it even more complicated, where the, that that illusion of choice that that white money gives to black artists. Uh, Jamie, you said um, always keep them laughing. Like, mm-hmm. yo, the help came out in twenty eleven. <laughs> yep. oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. You know what I mean? Like this shit is still like kind of like stuff like this is still like a thing. You know what I mean? It's like it's like we have it, it, it's like after Bamboozle spe- comes out, it's like there's still other types of movies that I mean, Green Book is a example of a movie that is literally like ho- has contempt for its black character, like actually, and like <laughs> it's like it's 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 a it's it's. it's yeah, it's it's immensely it's immensely um, it's a sta- that won the award, a right? Movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, that, that movie a, literally it's, it's won to... Best Picture, and I and I remember reading about yeah. the 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 character and being like, oh, so they literally just like in like it partially just like wrote things about this man that weren't true at all to who he was as a person, so that they could get like some lame jokes about coming together. And uh, solving <laughs> yeah. racism, yeah. Uh, so through bad. being, yeah, or by, just like by, by, by hanging or, out, or just like how, <laughs> yeah, exactly, by by chilling. Also, <laughs> it's also or just like, or just like how the introduction, the introductory scene of uh, Mar- uh, Mahershala Ali in that movie is him sitting on a throne, and like Viggo Mortensen's character is like coming in and it's like clearly this hierarchy of like, oh, well, like I'm a sophisticated black man. And it's like the way they shoot it, it's like they look at him as like this this type of like, who does this black man think he is? It's like, it's it's, it's, it's so funny to me. It's really crazy to me. And so like what really makes this movie so scathing to me is that these things are continuing to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, keep them laughing. It's like, this is, this is the way it continues to go, and so it, it's it's a um, 
yeah, it's it's definitely one of it's definitely Spike's most audacious film and one of his most scathing films in terms of the uh, just you know this is what white America has done kind of and so I I, I think it's a must watch for anybody who's yeah. into movies and, in general and, 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 and it's and, into the history of film. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I highly can't, can't recommend it enough. Yeah, and if, if you want to have an absolute blast, uh, go read all the very tepid, awkward reviews by white critics reviewing this movie <laughs> when it came out in 2000. <laughs> Where they were, they oh were all God. like, I mean, I mean, you know, it, it, Spike seems like he's doing something a little obvious, you know, and like, <laughs> like he, he basically, they basically sounded like the critics that he was making fun of, like in the actual movie itself. It's really, <laughs> right. really funny. You should go look up those reviews. God, they are. God bless, God bless Roger Ebert, but like he rates it like a two out of four. And like in his review, he's just like, the writing in this movie <laughs> like, made me just, uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. You don't he's say. Like, raise, he's like, it, it's like it raises important issues, but it handles it poorly. It's like, oh, you don't say, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think this is unbelievable. I, I would give it a four out of five for now, but this is, I've been thinking about it since I watched it a few days ago. And, uh, it's just, it, it's something that is truly, truly stuck with me. And just his level, like, he, he definitely, you know, is, is um, there is an abrasive nature to this film and, and, and an anger to it. But like I said before, it is also very composed and calculated. Like, he, the way that he is able to portray different perspectives and, and the internal struggle of, of race and racism for a bunch of different characters is, is incredible. Yeah, I just, once again, too, that, that montage just just really shows how much there is in the history of, of America and, and particularly for this film in the entertainment industry. So it's, it's something else. This is going to be a wild ride if it's your first time watching it, but it's, it's definitely a yeah. must. Uh, definitely. Yeah. A I, must, I, so. I, I still just can't get over the fact that that, that digital video way that he shoots, it gives it like such an ugly fun house. Like yeah, you see to it that like really makes you just feel even more uncomfortable. And then, and then when, when it hits the actual show, the most uncomfortable shit in the actual movie, it's beautiful. <laughs> like yeah. he films it like it's like the best thing you've ever seen. And uh, yeah, that, that just really, it, it, it's such a crazy choice and something that, that, that sits with me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah me too. It, it, it is. Yeah. I the, think that there is, are images I, in here. I won't be forgetting anytime. Yeah, soon, exactly. Sure. And I think there, I mean, there's a lot of unforgettable moments in spec movies that's too much power for one man to have for Malcolm X. I think it's probably the most unforgettable oh, moment yeah. I ever had in a spec movie, but there's the whole movie. in this one is just unforgettable. It's like, it's a, it's really a horror movie. It's a very, oh, it's yeah. a horror movie for me. It's like legitimately like, it's legitimately like, Holy shit. Like this thing is like, it's just, it's, it's, it's immediate. The movie is so immediate and it's, it, it's demands your attention from the beginning of the film because you kind of you're kind of looking to see where it's gonna go, and once it goes where it's going, you're like, "Holy hell! I can't believe this is happening." You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it 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 kind of it. You know, I'm a pretty like friendly guy, as y'all can tell, like pretty like outgoing guy. Blah blah blah. Like this movie is like the type of movie that like it kind of just like makes you like, "Yo, actually, shit is really crazy out here. Like they really be disrespecting <laughs> us." Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Like you know, it kind of like gets you, it kind of like gets you more and more tight. Like you're just like, nah, get out of here, bro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's 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 one of those. It's one of those. It like you fire, really have to take sure. a walk and just breathe. Yeah, it definitely does. It, it's like you have to take a walk and you have to like just breathe a little bit after watching it because it's legitimately like a horror film. It, it's it's yeah. and hopefully Very one amazing. day. I remember, Josh. I remember one time I saw a letterbox you did for Do the Right Thing. You said. A, a, I think you said something like a masterpiece that hopefully one day is outdated, and I kind of feel that way about. Well, I feel that way about a lot of spec movies, especially this one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it is for me a, a and do the right thing also, but also this one. It's it's very much like for me. I would rate this a high four out of five as well. I would rate a four point five out of five, and I would say that um, yeah, hopefully one day a movie like this does not feel permanent as it does. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It doesn't it, it doesn't so. feel as, as as uncomfortably real yeah. uh, in in many <laughs> yeah. ways? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean that that was that was bamboozled. Hopefully, we had some people watching it and checking it out. But yeah, you you will definitely need to take a walk after you finish that montage up, especially too because. <laughs> 
the way that it's just so absurd throughout most of its runtime and it, it hits that end where they all die and then you get the montage and you're just left with all the death and those images of racism and that's it that you're just left yeah. sitting there in that it's it's really horrible but i think that'll wrap it up for yeah. everything this week that was uh pd wheat straw and bamboozled thanks so much uh jason for for joining us and for bringing these films with you if you've yeah. got anything to plug this is uh usually where we have you do that i don't have a lot i don't have a lot to plug i'm coming out with a podcast soon that talks about the depth of of, I, I'm going to talk about certain albums in hip hop that I think are under discussed because I think that we, you know, a lot of critics kind of recycle the same like Illmatics, Doggy yeah. Style, you know, For the sure. same type of classics. And I'm 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 talking. I'm going to talk about. So the first episode I did was Re- Prodigy's Return of the Back, which is a solo album that he did in 2007. That was like a street mixtape. And so I'm going to talk about a lot of unheralded classics that I think Canon has missed. And so I'm coming out with that soon, but you can find my writing. I'm a freelance music journalist. Um, I, I interviewed Benny the Butcher for Rolling Stone last week. Uh, I, yeah, I think I, I saw I that. Did That's a review awesome. on Draco the Draco the. Thank you, man. I, I did the uh, I did a Draco the Ruler review for Pitchfork last week too. So I, I I put out stuff on the regular. So you know you can come and come and follow me on Twitter. My name at Jason Buford, J A Y S O N B U F O R D. So yeah. Hell yeah, yeah. I definitely recommend doing that. Uh, in in uh, one week's time, for our listeners, we are going to be back. And what are we going to be doing? We are going to be talking about a bit of a left turn, although we're going to be talking a little bit of sports movies, I guess. We don't do sports movies, so I think the last time we did was, uh, we did we did boxing again, too. We did, we did Fat oh, City yeah. was the last time I think we talked a sports movie. And but Tokyo we're going to be talking... And Tokyo Fist, yes, the the horror boxing movie, which <laughs> right. was very fun to talk about. But uh, with with this one, we're going back to some classics because uh, we've 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 been meaning to get around to some Sylvester Stallone again, and we we haven't really done it since we did our big. Uh, we we went through the entire Rambo franchise. I think was the last time we were talking about Stallone. So we figured we'd kind of do that again, and we're going to talk about some Rocky. So next week we're going to be talking about Rocky. Obviously, 1976, I don't think anyone needs to be told what that is. And then we're going to be talking about <laughs> Rocky II from 1979. Um, so the, the the follow-up film where Stallone actually took over the directing, which I thought was kind of cute with the uh, the announcement that Michael B. Jordan is going to be doing the same and directing Creed Three. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's awesome. That is cool. <laughs> By the way, yes. oh, also would like to say something one right quick Creed should have won best picture like the first I'm one should have won best picture I'm with you yeah, Yo, I'm with I think the first one I think the first one is like legitimately one of the greatest movies of that decade like it I, is so I, good I like it as much as I like the original Rocky uh, it is my favorite other than the original Rocky and yeah I'm I'm right there with you I, I saw that movie like three times yo, in theaters it is a blast oh my god it's, it's, so it's, well it's shot. one of my favorite it's so it's like like the scene where the Meek Mill song is playing and like the yep, the, yep. the mopes are are behind him. Yo, that shit oh, is yeah. so affecting. Oh, Just like the, um, they they have those classic yo. Rocky horns with Me- Meek Mill on top of them. Man, just yeah, crazy. It's so oh my sick. god! It's so, what's his face? It's uh, so Lud- Lud- Ludwig Goransson, I think, was the guy who did uh, Gambino's producer. Was the guy? Oh, dude, who he's did, so uh, good. If he's the Ludwig, oh, really? I'm thinking of. He's yeah. amazing. Yo, because it, it, it's like the difference between generations too. Was that yo yeah. that that movie? I can't. Chef's Kiss, the first Creed movie. Chef's Kiss. Like I can't even say enough great things about that movie. Oh, it's so yeah, good. I'm I'm right there yeah. with you. Uh, really and, and and following talking about Sil- Sylvester Stallone and this idea of kind of, you know, him as sort of the uh, you know, he he wrote the movie, starred in the movie, and in the second one he also directed the movie even. So we're talking about sort of like the in front of the camera auteur like Rudy Ray Moore. Uh, we're going to be talking <laughs> about another version of that uh, one week after for the for the free listeners, because again, the, the Rocky episode is going to be over on patreon.com slash Thesoids podcast next week. And in two weeks, we're going to have a special guest on to be talking about another in front and behind the camera, Ochoa, Steven Seagal. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where the guest a, has picked for man. us uh, above the law. <laughs> which I haven't seen, Hell and yeah. also on Deadly Ground. Ooh, which I've got that it, on I, DVD. I, Fantastic. <laughs> which I which I've heard on Deadly Ground is directed by Steven Seagal. Oh, so, <laughs> dude, that's gonna be magical. 
This podcast is gonna rule, man. This next the next episode is gonna rule. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're 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 very excited. So so stay tuned. That's the next two weeks coming up. Uh, but until then, uh, I think that's it for everything. So uh, keep us easy. Keep it sleazy. <laughs>